It's the most advanced stealth fighter ever developed, capable of defeating any radar ever invented, and it can kill 10 American F-22 Raptors with just one missile, at least if you listen to the Russian Ministry of Defense. But why is an aircraft the Russians claim is more advanced than the American F-22 and F-35 conspicuously absent over the skies of Ukraine, exactly where it's needed the most by Russian forces? The Su-57 is a Russian multi-role fighter that's Russia's first attempt at a fifth-generation aircraft. It was conceived in 1999 after its predecessor, the Mikoil Project 144, proved to be entirely too expensive to actually put into production. The Project 144 was meant to be an answer to America's own F-22, which was at the time nearing completion and initial operational capability. However, the collapse of the Soviet Union led to an economic crisis and the project struggled to find adequate funding. The MiG-144 would have its maiden flight in February 2000 and then be cancelled shortly after. The Su-57, NATO codename Felon, was meant to build upon the successes of the 144 and field a true fifth-generation fighter. By now, the United States was starting to churn out the F-22 Raptor, and Russia had no answer to this critical threat. But almost inevitably, the Felon ran into its own financial difficulties, and a program that was meant to produce a fleet of fighters by the mid-2000s would only deliver its first operational aircraft in 2020. Russia couldn't afford to produce the Su-57 on its own, though, and troubles began early when Russia and India signed an agreement to co-develop the aircraft in September 2010. As the project evolved, however, Indian engineers voiced serious concerns about the aircraft's capabilities and survivability against American fifth-generation fighters. By 2014, India had lost faith in the Su-57 and formally abandoned the program, leaving Russia to finance it on its own. This immediately put a massive financial strain on Russia, further compounded by sanctions of high-technology goods from the West after its annexation of Crimea. The Su-57 struggled through development, and a fleet once envisioned to consist of over a hundred aircraft ended up producing only a dozen or so test models. In 2018, Russia claimed that the Su-57 took part in combat operations in Syria. However, there's no real proof that the jet performed any combat duties in the country. It's very likely, then, that Russia merely deployed the plane there to fly a few non-combat sorties so as to attempt to rouse interest from foreign investors, a very common tactic by the Russian defense industry. With a poorly diversified economy under pressure from sanctions, Russia relies heavily on foreign buyers to fund its weapons development programs. Despite no verifiable proof of the plane's combat record, Russia claims that it partook in combat operations both in Syria and now in Ukraine where Russian Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu claimed that Su-57s took part in operations to neutralize Ukrainian air defenses, eliminating multiple Ukrainian surface-to-air missile batteries. Since we've all learned that Russia literally never lies ever, this is an impressive feat for an airplane that's technically still in development. What's more impressive about this claim, however, is the fact that the Su-57 is not even believed by Western observers to be a true stealth aircraft merely one with stealth characteristics. Observers point to difficulties by the Russians in joining panels of the body together tightly enough to reduce radar return, as well as its glaringly non-stealthy engines. The body of the aircraft is also significantly less stealthy than American counterparts, giving off far larger radar returns from the sides and rear. This, however, is in line with the Russian philosophy of operating aircraft only within the safety of ground-based air defenses. The Russians simply couldn't afford to field an all-aspect stealth aircraft and thus focused only on frontal stealth. The aircraft also appears to lack another quality of a fifth-generation fighter, data link capabilities. While tests are underway to have the Su-57 speak with a drone companion, this is far from the capabilities of the US F-35, which can operate as a sort of mini air control platform in place of traditional AWACS, speaking with a variety of friendly aircraft and helping guide weapons and planes to their targets. However, the Su-57 does have some design advantages over real fifth-generation aircraft in America's arsenal. For one, it's far more maneuverable than any U.S. aircraft, and this is a big clue to the fact that the Russians know this is not a peer to an American fifth-generation fighter. That's because the super maneuverability is not a design feature of a traditional fifth-gen aircraft, which are designed to operate as assassins, not knife fighters. F-35s and F-22s are built to engage enemy targets from beyond visual range with advanced AIM-120D missiles that have ranges in excess of 90 miles. Not only is this missile range outside the range of most other enemy missiles, but the stealth characteristics of an F-22 or F-35 means that an enemy being fired on won't even be able to detect the stealth fighter until it's much, much closer, estimated at about three dozen or so miles. With limited internal payloads of six to eight missiles, stealth aircraft should never be involved in a dogfight. Thus, super maneuverability is only desired if you have reason to believe your aircraft will be forced into dogfights. Because it's not stealthy enough, 
or has the targeting capabilities to engage in a long-range fight. So while the Su-57 is capable of some truly impressive acrobatic feats, this will be meaningless in over 90% of engagements against an adversary such as the US Air Force. Further giving clues to the fact that the Su-57 is not a true stealth aircraft are its cheek-mounted radars, which allow it to guide missiles to target at far more extreme angles than its American counterparts. This allows the Su-57 to turn further away from its target than an American plane and still maintain a good radar lock. But you only build this capability if you expect your aircraft to have to fight at close ranges where extreme maneuvers are required, or if you expect your aircraft to have to notch or defend against enemy missiles while guiding its own to the target. It's likely the Russian knew from the start the Felon would be detectable at far greater range than US aircraft and would need the ability to maneuver away from incoming missiles while maintaining a lock for its own. Despite this, the Russian Ministry of Defense claims the Su-57 is not just a match, but superior to the F-22 and F-35. If that's the case, then where is Russia's premier aircraft when its army needs it the most in the skies over Ukraine? First, if all claims about the Su-57 are true, Russia simply wouldn't be able to field them in large enough numbers to make much of a difference. Currently, there are only about a dozen or so Su-57s in operation, and most of these are test aircraft not meant for combat duty. This likely only leaves just over half a dozen that could carry weapons to target successfully. But there's no evidence outside of Russian claims that this has actually happened. The best the world can manage is a video of an aircraft with a similar shape to the Su-57 captured on video early in the war carrying out an air-to-ground attack. Most experts agree that if the Su-57 is truly engaged in combat with Ukraine, then it's not seeing frontline duty. Rather, the plane is likely only firing standoff attack munitions at long ranges from the safety of Russian airspace. Armed with the right weapons, the Su-57 could potentially stay out of range of Ukrainian air defenses and destroy them, as claimed by Russia, but there's practically no chance that Russia is willing to risk flying its flagship aircraft over the front lines where it could potentially be shot down, causing Russia heaps of international embarrassment, at least more than it's earned so far. This is doubly true when you consider that Russia also fears Western weapons employed by Ukraine and knows for a fact that Western nations are feeding a steady diet of intelligence to Ukraine's armed forces. So why is the Su-57 not in operation over Ukraine? First, there's simply not enough of them to be worth employing. Russia has goals of just under 100 of the fighter by 2027, something that is completely unrealistic given extreme Western sanctions against the nation. If your military is having to strip washers and microwaves for microchips, you're not going to be fielding 100 stealth fighters in five years. Secondly, the plane was almost certainly not nearly as capable as Russia claims it to be. And the last thing Russia wants is the embarrassment of having one shot down by Ukraine. Russia has lost an estimated 144 aircraft in the war, with two dozen of those being frontline manned fighters or ground attack aircraft. The threat environment is too high for Russia to risk the PR disaster that would ensure if a felon was shot down by the Ukrainians. On February 24, 2022, Vladimir Putin launched an invasion of Ukraine. His first attacks were west out of the separatist region of Donetsk and Luhansk, quickly followed by a thrust south from Belarus toward Kyiv. Russia's much-vaunted paratroopers and air assault forces attempted several landings outside of Kyiv but were repelled and failed in their mission. The plan was to quickly take Kyiv by flying reinforcements directly into major airfields outside of the city, and it was immediately cancelled. Over the next month, troops pushed north out of Russian-occupied Crimea in an attempt to link up with assaults out of Luhansk and Donetsk. An amphibious invasion of Odessa was greatly feared, but Ukrainian resistance was much stiffer than expected, and the invasion was cancelled. In the north of the country, the Kyiv incursion was met with fierce resistance and soon ran into serious logistics problems. Inevitably, Russian forces were forced to flee back to Belarus, having failed to take Ukraine's capital. Similar incursions along the northern border east of Kyiv were also repulsed. Russia moved its defeated troops from the Kyiv assault to the east, where the war was faring better for them. Now, though, Russian forces have reached a sort of stalemate, and the conflict is largely frozen with only minor advancements by either side. Russia, however, has continued to suffer catastrophic defeats, including the near-total defeat of an entire battalion tactical group outside of Bilohorivka, thanks to a well-planned Ukrainian ambush. Kherson, which has been firmly in Russian hands for weeks, is soon to be in dispute with Ukrainian forces making serious pushes toward the city. What Ukraine does when the war is over depends on how the next few months of the war play out. There are two probable scenarios for Ukraine's future and one nightmare scenario that's more frighteningly real than you might realize. But before we look at those scenarios, I have an important question for you. 
Do you begin every morning by lying in bed and endlessly scrolling through social media looking for news? Maybe you get little snippets of random stories, most of which have literally no relevance to you. If you're like me, then it leaves you feeling unfulfilled, uninformed, and overall it's a terrible way to start off your day. I need to change my routine, which is why I'm so happy I found out about the sponsor of today's video, Morning Brew. Morning Brew is a free newsletter that gets you up to speed on the topics that matter to you in a witty, fun, informative way in just five minutes, like why airports have been such a mess lately, why oil prices have been rapidly changing, or that there's a 76 million year old dinosaur skeleton about to go up for auction. Of course, it's likely to sell for at least 5 million bucks, so I'll probably be sitting that one out. But unlike the fossilized Gorgosaurus, signing up for Morning Brew is completely free and it takes less than 15 seconds. So whether you're interested in business, finance, or tech, you can become smarter in 5 minutes every day by signing up for Morning Brew at morningbrewdaily.com infographics or click that link in the description. In the first scenario, Russian forces successfully recoup their losses and press their great numbers advantage by flooding the nation with an additional two dozen battalion tactical groups and perhaps enacting general mobilization, Russia begins to put serious pressure on Ukraine's military. Inevitably, the massive Russian war machine slowly but painfully crushes all resistance before it. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky has now two choices. First, he can surrender when it becomes clear that further resistance is futile. This will inevitably come at the cost of his own presidency, as the Kremlin will not accept any surrender from Ukraine that doesn't involve the removal of Zelensky as a precondition. This scenario is unlikely, as it would require Russia to generate a significant amount of momentum that it's been unable to generate yet. Only if Russian forces are making advances of several miles or more a day would continued resistance seem futile to Ukrainian defenders. Zelensky would thus see further resistance as simply a waste of his military's lives. But luckily for Ukraine, this seems completely impossible. For starters, Ukraine has a lot of territory to trade for time. This should be a strategy familiar to the Russians, as is exactly what they did in the war against Germany, trading miles upon miles of territory in exchange for the time to build up proper defenses. Russia, however, is even more vulnerable to a territory for time strategy than Germany was, as their logistics were already terrible to begin with, and only worsened with the destruction of hundreds of cargo and transport trucks by the Ukrainian and foreign volunteers fighting with them. Drawing Russian forces deep into Ukrainian territory will result in overstretched supply lines and open up opportunities elsewhere for Ukraine to counterattack. Russian losses are severe after only three months of fighting with an estimated 25% of all combat personnel from the initial invasion force now either killed or too wounded to continue fighting. Tank and armored vehicle losses for Russia are so heavy, it's estimated it'll take two years to replenish them at this point, and the losses continue to mount. In short, Russia cannot realistically generate the momentum necessary for forcing an early surrender by Zelensky, and pumping thousands of freshly mobilized conscripts into the conflict will in all likelihood only hurt the Russian cause rather than help it. So, we're rating an early surrender by Zelensky a very low probability as of May 11, 2022. President Zelensky's second choice is to fight Russia to a slowly losing standstill. What we mean by this is that the front lines will remain largely frozen, but with tiny incremental gains by Russian forces over time. As a matter of fact, that seems to be the nature of the conflict right now, with Russia being hammered badly and winning only small gains, though the Ukrainians themselves have managed their own small gains, so we're not quite at this scenario yet. However, inevitably it might become clear that Russia simply cannot be defeated by Ukraine, and Zelensky's second choice is to negotiate a peace with special conditions with Russia. This will likely mean that Ukraine gives up much of its territory in the Donbas region, which is largely under Russian control today and gives up its strategic seaports along the Sea of Azov. Crimea is guaranteed to remain in Russian hands, and the Sea of Azov now becomes a Russian lake fully under its control. Initially, Vladimir Putin claimed that he had no intention of occupying Ukraine. However, not only is Putin proven to be a liar, but Russian forces have been well documented doing everything they can to quickly russify occupied territories. They've replaced Ukrainian street and building signs with their Russian counterparts, instituted provisional governments, ensured the pensions of elderly Ukrainians, and introduced the Russian ruble as the official currency. All this has been done to purposefully entrench Russian culture inside of Ukraine itself, in preparation for their full adoption into the Russian fold. Currently, Ukraine is likely unable to fully eject Russian forces from its territory, which means that this is the most likely scenario. While Ukraine is being armed and supplied by the West, it's not being given the heavy equipment necessary for a large offensive operation against Russian forces. However, if the conflict continues to rage for a year or more, this might change, as it takes months to train Ukrainian crews to operate Western tanks or aircraft and also set up the supply chains and logistics hubs needed to operate them inside Ukraine. 
Even then, arming Ukraine at a large scale with Western heavy equipment is incredibly unlikely unless this war drags on for years and becomes another decade-long debacle for Russia, much like Afghanistan was to the Soviet Union and then later the US. It's unlikely then that Ukraine will be able to successfully repel Russia's invasion and push them back to their own borders, though Ukraine could instead make the conflict so painful for Russia that it agrees to a settled peace with the currently occupied territories part of the cost of continued Ukrainian independence. In this case, without being able to threaten Kyiv, it's highly unlikely that Russia also presses for the removal of President Zelensky, and Ukraine will be able to remain largely free to dictate its own course. It is, however, very likely that peace in either of these two scenarios comes with the condition that Ukraine remain committed to absolute neutrality and repeals its constitutional amendment which enshrines NATO membership directly into the constitution of the country. Depending on how bad the war goes for Ukraine in the long run, additional concessions might have to be given, including the establishment of some form of veto power by Russia over internal Ukrainian matters, in essence a return to the era of the Soviet Union. The second possible scenario for Ukraine is a total military defeat of Russia and the expulsion of Russian invading forces back to the breakaway regions of Luhansk and Donetsk. Given what we've just discussed, this seems like the far least likely of the two scenarios, but certain key facts could dramatically alter the course of war. The first and likely most important fact is that Russia is taking completely unsustainable losses in the conflict. At a current rate of personnel and equipment loss, Russia will have lost the equivalent of its entire invasion force within six more months, an absolute military catastrophe for Russia, which would take decades to recover from. These losses are having a dramatic follow-on effect, though as reports from all across the front paint a picture of severely demoralized Russian troops. Demoralized troops are a massive liability in war, and the fact that Russia is facing such a significant morale problem that is fed by near-daily large-scale losses puts the fighting ability of the Russian military in serious jeopardy. Those losses are inevitably being filled with more and more conscripts as the pool of professional volunteers runs low, and conscripts bring even further weak morale to units already suffering from a borderline morale crisis. But if Russia's only problem was morale, it would count itself lucky, because a big reason for the low morale and high casualties is Russia's sheer ineptitude. The Russian military was greatly feared prior to the conflict, with news agencies around the world commenting on the massive modernization effort Russia undertook over the last two decades. To show off its capabilities, Russia put on annual military exercises involving tens of thousands of troops, all meant to showcase Russian firepower to NATO observers. And the conclusions were grim. Russia had become extremely adept at combined arms maneuvers and was a modern military to be feared. Day one of the invasion completely changed all of that. And since then, the Russian military has exposed that it's always been a paper tiger. Troops routinely show little discipline and even less training as they scatter and panic during ambushes instead of fighting back or conducting flank assaults to relieve pressure on the ambush kill zone. Air defense batteries are destroyed on the ground by Ukrainian jets and drones because their operators never bothered to turn their air defense radars on. The Russian military is so inept that Ukraine has even managed to strike deep inside Russia with its own attack helicopters, completely to the surprise of any air defense radar operators. It's not just that Russian troops are poorly trained, it's that Russia is simply bad at war. These exercises, which showed off their great combined arms skills, were clearly highly scripted, because inside of Ukraine, under actual enemy fire, Russia has yet to conduct a satisfactory combined arms operation. In the realm of battlefield logistics, Russia has proven itself to be worse than an office, as fundamentally its battalion tactical groups simply don't have enough trucks for proper resupply. Russian weapon stockpiles have also run dangerously low of precision munitions, to the point that by the start of May, we are seeing heavy use of unguided bombs and attacks that once used precision munitions. It's now believed that Russia's remaining reserves are a fraction of their original size, and dedicated to supporting potential contingency operations in case of war against NATO. That means they can't be used in Ukraine, or else Russia faces being completely unprepared to fight NATO armies. There are even reports that Russia is resorting to the use of mothballed 1960s missiles for long-range strikes, with weapons that are potentially as dangerous to the Russians launching them as they are to whoever's on the other end of the poorly guided munitions. The tail of the tape adds up to this. Russia is entering a serious crisis that could blossom into full-blown catastrophe if the situation on the ground doesn't change dramatically. Unlike Western nations, Russia can't rebuild its precision weapon stockpiles because of global sanctions, as the electronic components it relies on are built in places like Taiwan. This leaves it with only one choice, return to fighting a 20th century conflict much like during the World War II era 
with comparable equipment. Yet, while Ukraine is suffering its own heavy losses, it's being steadily resupplied by the West. If resupply of heavy equipment continues, and possibly even transfer of Western hardware like the M1 Abrams tank, in six months Russia could find itself trying to throw 20th century weapons at 21st century Ukrainian threats. It's not completely inconceivable then that the problems of bad morale, terrible training and doctrine, and a lack of modern equipment leaves the Russians to be overwhelmed by Ukrainian forces equipped with superior Western technologies. A morale crisis similar to the 1917 crisis that resulted in Russia leaving the First World War could prompt a wide-scale defeat of Russia inside Ukraine, and with it a catastrophic political upheaval for Putin that will likely end up with him in prison or more likely dead. But it's exactly the flooding of Ukraine with Western arms that could lead to our third nightmare scenario, and one that's more probable than you think. If Russia begins to suffer serious defeats, or if Ukraine begins to receive large shipments of heavy Western equipment, it might leave Putin with only one choice – the use of weapons of mass destruction. Already Russia has laid down the groundwork for justifying the use of chemical weapons, as it's used its state propaganda arm to spew a steady stream of lies claiming that Ukrainians have several bio and chemical weapon labs in the country being funded by the United States. Some Russian state news outlets even claim that Ukrainian forces or mercenaries hired by the US have already carried out small-scale chemical attacks. This is merely the beginning of a false flag attack staged by Russia to justify the use of weapons against the stubborn Ukrainian defenders that so far it's failed to dislodge with conventional means. Russia has little to fear from using these weapons too, as Ukraine is unable to respond in kind, as it has no WMDs of its own. We could see widespread chemical attacks across the Eastern Front followed by massive assaults against severely weakened Ukrainian forces. However, American President Joe Biden has warned that this is a line in the sand for him, and that if Russia were to use WMDs inside Ukraine, the United States would respond appropriately. The interpretation of this response has been purposefully left vague, but it could mean everything from American strikes using chemical, biological, or nuclear weapons against Russian forces inside Ukraine to directly supplying Ukraine with its own chemical or biological weapons. Either move would turn Ukraine into a hellscape reminiscent of 1916 Central Europe, only at a far greater magnitude due to the increased lethality of modern chemical and biological weapons. Should Putin step across that line to the use of nuclear weapons, Ukraine might find large swaths of territory irradiated after only even a limited exchange of nuclear weapons. This naturally carries with it the risk of escalation as Russia and NATO turn their nuclear weapons on each other instead, prompting what might be the final conflict in history. Whatever path Ukraine's future takes, it's certain that it will take years, if not decades, to recover from this war. Many cities are partially or largely destroyed after indiscriminate Russian barrages purposefully targeting civilians, and these will take incredible effort and resources to rebuild. Yet, Europe rebuilt from two world wars, and the United States is committed to Ukraine for the long term. We'll likely see a 21st century Marshall Plan after the liberation of Ukraine, financed in large part by the US, and in time the nation will heal. However, in what fashion Ukraine survives as a state, free or Soviet-style client, remains to be seen as does just how much of its territory it'll get to keep intact. As of the making of this video on September 13, 2022, Ukrainian armed forces have delivered Russia its greatest tactical defeat since it failed to take Kyiv at the start of the war. Many in the West are calling Ukraine's recent counteroffensive game-changing, and even Russian propagandists have expressed great alarm and concern over the success of the offensive. Going as far as to admit Russian forces were forced to retreat from the Kharkiv region, but how in the world was this counteroffensive so successful, and does this risk the use of nuclear weapons by a desperate Russia? Ukraine's counteroffensive began on September 6, but it had been gestating for weeks before. To much fanfare, Ukraine announced a significant buildup of forces in the south, aimed at retaking Kherson. The city is a strategically important hub in the south of Ukraine that would allow Ukrainian forces to push even deeper into the south and even attack Crimea with long-range munitions. With an attack on the Saki Air Base in Crimea in early August that left many Russian planes destroyed or damaged, an attack on Kherson seemed like a serious threat. The buildup of Ukrainian forces prompted Russia to redeploy 10 battalion tactical groups to the south to reinforce the region. It's still too early and details remain classified, 
But it's beginning to look as if the attack on Kherson had the goal of overextending the Russian line over the Dnieper River, or perhaps Ukraine simply exploited weakened Russian positions in the north. What's for sure is that while the attack on Kherson has made some modest progress, Russia has absolutely been routed around Kharkiv, with full-scale retreat by the Russians so chaotic and panicked that tens of millions of dollars of equipment and ammunition were simply left behind. The key to Ukraine's success begins with one weapon system, the High Mobility Artillery Rocket System, developed and fielded by the United States and provided to Ukraine in small quantities at the start of the summer. Wary of committing large amounts of sophisticated equipment that might end up destroyed or captured by superior Russian firepower, the dozen or so HIMARS units initially supplied were put to immediate and cleverly devastating use by the Ukrainians. HIMARS combines far superior range over traditional artillery with precision, allowing Ukrainian forces to hit Russia where it hurt most, with a range of about 57 miles. Using standard rockets or 190 miles using the Army Tactical Missile System, HIMARS enabled Ukraine to reach out to enemy rear areas and devastate command posts and supply hubs. Russia's senior officers, who were already an endangered species on the Ukrainian battlefield, were now being assassinated from dozens of miles away. This forced the relocation of command posts a hundred or more miles away away from the front lines. This simple move was devastating to an army with a heavy top-down command structure. Russian forces lack a strong non-commissioned officer corps thanks to their heavy reliance on conscripts and difficulty keeping professional soldiers interested in re-enlistment. This means that the senior officers often have to be on or near the front lines to ensure their orders are carried out, but now it was suddenly very dangerous for them to be anywhere near the front, forcing them back and giving them less operational control over the units. But we'll get more into that when we discuss the reason Ukrainian units are more successful than Russian units. It wasn't just command posts that had to be moved, but ammunition and fuel depots as well. With several weeks of shaping operations, Ukraine set the stage for the counteroffensive. Russia, showing incredible ineptitude, largely stood by and allowed these shaping operations to continue nearly unchallenged. The end result was catastrophic, as Ukraine destroyed huge amounts of logistical supplies and forced Russia to move its supply hubs far from the front. This had the direct effect of limiting the maneuverability of Russian units, who now had to wait twice or even three times as long for resupply as they normally would. Being forced to sit on your hands is a good way to lose in a modern war, as Russia quickly found out. Another American weapon that Ukraine put to excellent use in shaping the battlefield before its counteroffensive was the HARM missile, or high-speed anti-radiation missile. Provided to Ukraine in classified numbers, an effort by American and Ukrainian engineers resulted in the adaptation of Western-style mounts for the HARM for Ukraine's Soviet-made planes. Once equipped with HARMs, Ukraine's air force began to target Russian radars to devastating effect. The loss of air defense and counter-battery radars made it increasingly difficult for Russia to defend against air attack or retaliate against Ukrainian artillery with its own barrages. This ended up being a major game-changer on the battlefield, bringing a level of parity between the two powers. The loss of confidence in detecting and shooting down Ukrainian fighters was likely part of the reason why the attack in the north was such a surprise. Russian recon aircraft and drones were apparently not being used in large amounts, likely due to fear of being shot down. The next reason for Ukraine's wildly successful counteroffensive is its fundamental military strengths over Russia. Russia is by far the more powerful military, but it's also by far the least capable, a fact Ukraine has exploited to great advantage. Back in 2014, when Russia rolled into Crimea, the Ukrainian military was at a crisis point. It was terribly trained and poorly equipped, trying to fight off Russian forces by using the same Soviet doctrine that Russia itself used. However, shortly after the Crimean invasion, the United States and other NATO partners entered Ukraine and began a comprehensive training and restructuring program for its military. Hundreds of Americans would make the trip to Ukraine over the next eight years, training Ukraine in Western doctrine and tactics and completely reshaping its military. The result is not perfect, but Ukraine's armed forces today more closely resemble a professional Western force than they did in 2014. Ukrainian junior officers and commanders are encouraged to seize the initiative and make their own decisions in the midst of combat, a characteristic lacked by the Russian side. This allows Ukrainian units to be far more adaptable and maneuverable than their Russian counterparts, who must sit and wait for orders from their higher-ups before doing anything not already discussed in contingency planning. As Ukrainian forces began to discover vulnerabilities in Russian defenses in the north, this freedom of initiative would come to play in significant ways as Ukrainian commanders ordered their units to further exploit defensive gaps. Unable to adjust their defenses as the combat environment evolved around them, Russian units were forced to simply flee, though a significant number would simply surrender. 
The penetration of Russian lines allowed Ukrainian armor and mechanized infantry to then sweep into the rear areas and wreak havoc amongst the lightly defended support units there, such as the artillery and support units. This only aggravated the growing panic from the Russians, prompting even further unauthorized retreats. Once gaps were exploited in the Russian lines, the fundamental structure of the Russian military worked directly against it. Russia is fundamentally an artillery army. It knows it's technologically and professionally outclassed by Western counterparts, and has thus sought to achieve some level of parity with the West by fielding significant artillery forces, outnumbering even the United States in tube and rocket artillery. Yet this over-reliance on artillery means that once their front line has been compromised, there's little that Russian support can do. Artillery is slow, even self-propelled guns, and poorly suited to defend against a fast-moving mechanized offensive without infantry in the way to slow it down. Once Ukrainian forces were through Russian lines, artillery crews had no choice but to flee, often leaving their equipment behind. Another key difference between Russian and Ukrainian forces is not just training or doctrine, but simple esprit de corps. Russian forces have long known to be increasingly demoralized by the grinding war in Ukraine. For starters, none of them saw the Ukrainians as enemies before the war, but rather as a brother nation. Then, when the war began, they were promised a swift victory and that they'd be met with hugs and flowers by the locals. Instead, the offensive to take Kyiv failed, while Russian troops in the east were met with Molotov cocktails. Their deployment of modern Western weapons in Ukraine took an even greater toll on the Russian morale, as American HIMARS and Excalibur-guided artillery shells wreaked precision havoc amongst Russian forces. Compounding Russian logistics problems led to some units running completely out of food and being forced to steal or scavenge from locals, creating even more morale problems for the Russian military. By comparison, Ukraine's forces are highly motivated both by their desire to defend the homeland, but also by a sense of vengeance over Russian atrocities across occupied territories. Putin, now known as the Butcher of Bukha, waged a campaign of unrestricted warfare against Ukrainian civilians, and his military has used murder and worse as tools meant to weaken Ukrainian morale and their will to fight. However, these tactics have backfired and given Ukraine's defenders an even greater desire to throw Russian forces out of their country. President Zelensky's refusal to leave the capital when it seemed as if it would fall any day made him an instant hero in the eyes of the people and gave the nation a critically needed morale boost. The Russians don't now know why they're fighting. The Ukrainians, on the other hand, know exactly what's at stake if they don't. Ukrainian troops are not just better trained and increasingly better equipped, but far more motivated to fight than the Russians. While the exact number is unknown yet, given the secrecy of the ongoing operation, it's estimated that as many as 3,000 Russians may have surrendered to the Ukrainians. What is known is that Ukrainian authorities have said that they have recently captured so many POWs that they're running out of room to house them. The final reason for Ukraine's success comes down to Russia itself. Despite formerly being considered the world's second most powerful nation, Russia has proven that it's completely unprepared to face a modern foe. In the face of modern Western weapons and doctrine, Russian forces have faltered or stumbled directly into disaster. They seem to show no recognition of the power of long-range precision munitions, perhaps best explained by the fact that Russia itself has traditionally fielded few smart weapons, relying heavily on dumb, unguided munitions. A staggering disregard for electronic and signals intelligence has allowed the US and other NATO nations to track down and pinpoint Russian VIPs, passing the information along to Ukrainian frontline units armed with precision Excalibur artillery rounds or other smart weapons. The US has not commented much on the intelligence it shares with Ukraine, but many suspect that the Americans are giving Ukraine pretty much every drop of intelligence that they gather, with drones flying just outside the conflict area, satellites, human sources, and electronic eavesdropping measures. The US intelligence apparatus has been able to provide Ukraine with mountains of intelligence and made surprise military operations by Russia all but impossible. The Ukrainians have also been able to tap into a wealth of intelligence provided by partisans behind enemy lines, as well as fully exploiting Russian foolishness. Multiple times now, Russian TV crews have filmed near-sensitive military equipment or personnel, leading to an immediate and devastating response by Ukrainian forces. In one particularly noteworthy incident in August, a Russian reporter posted a photo of a Wagner Group mercenary outside their barracks in occupied Ukraine. The photo included the street address of the building, and Ukraine used high Mars launchers to level it, leading to the death of up to 100 Wagner mercenaries. As the war continues to rage on, some or even all of Ukraine's gains could be reversed, though that's very unlikely. Russian forces are increasingly exhausted, demoralized, and rebellious. And it's rumored that Russia is suspending the sending of new units to Ukraine, 
This could make an increasingly desperate Putin resort to extreme measures, such as the use of chemical, biological, or nuclear weapons, facing growing opposition at home as multiple municipalities including St. Petersburg and two Moscow districts call for his resignation. Putin almost certainly views a general retreat from Ukraine as wholly unacceptable. This might make the next phase of the war even more, not less dangerous than before. However, that's no reason for Western support for Ukraine to falter right now when it matters most. With fighting set to die down during the difficult winter season, this is the time for the West to prepare Ukraine for even greater counteroffensives come springtime, this time equipped with large numbers of Western vehicles and weapons. It's the beginning of October 2022. A young American man is doing something spectacularly unusual. He is actually reading a newspaper. So what does he learn from this mysterious object of yore? Well, it's Jimmy Carter's 98th birthday. The US and Venezuela just did a prisoner swap, and it's the five-year anniversary of the deadliest mass shooting in US modern history. But the story that gets his attention is headlined, Ukraine has been turned into a giant scrap heap of Russian tanks. What's going on? What's been going on? That's what we'll find out today. It's true, if you went to certain areas of Ukraine right now, you'd find what look like graveyards for Russian tanks. The tanks, usually looking like they're well past their prime, are everywhere. You can see photos of them in the background as Ukrainians go about their normal day. Take for example the town of Izium in the Kharkiv Oblast province in eastern Ukraine. This place used to look majestic. These days, if you walk through parts of Izium, the word that would spring to mind is apocalypse. It was liberated in September 2022, but not before five months of fighting. When the Russians were there, they spent some of their time interrogating, torturing, and killing residents. One of them who survived later said he was interrogated and shocked by one of those old Soviet military field telephones. Another witness said, Russians wore masks and tortured civilians with bare electric wires. Mass graves were later dug up, with the Western media saying this was now a pattern of Russian occupation. We only know this, of course, because the Russians left in a hurry. They didn't just retreat, but they left all kinds of things behind, including quite a lot of tanks, some bashed up, some just abandoned. The Washington Post wrote, Ukrainian troops have documented war machines in various states, from combat-ready tanks to vehicles in need of repair. In some cases, Ukrainian forces have obliterated Russian weapons, leaving smoldering vehicles to be discovered by the advancing forces. In one of the videos, you can actually hear a Ukrainian talking about the Russian tanks as if they were the bounty of school kids' stolen candy. One of the soldiers says, you and I get a tank, we all get a tank each. This was just one town. If you were to visit the town of Liman in the Donbass region, you'd see something similar. You'd find tanks all over the place, some of which have been damaged, but some that were abandoned in decent shape. What a gift that is to the Ukrainians. We'll come to the value of such tanks a bit later. One media report said the aftermath of the Russian retreat was a macabre scene. Bodies of Russian and Ukrainian soldiers were strewn all over the streets. A Ukrainian resident told the Ukrainian soldier, the smell is unbearable, stray dogs have already eaten two of them. When are you coming to pick up these dead bodies? She might have also asked, when are you going to take all those damn tanks away? The retreat was described as embarrassing for Putin. Not only had the Russian army lost a lot of young men, but again the Russians had lost a lot of very expensive machinery too. The Guardian wrote, Video showed burned out vehicles, personal belongings, and dead soldiers strewn across a forest road. Ukrainian forces recovered at least one T-72 tank, which had suffered minor damage. Carnage everywhere, dead people lying in the streets, families found dead in their cars, and a great big pile up of heavy-duty military weapons. You can read a news story similar to this relating to a number of places. Earlier in the year, news reports suggested that Russia was losing about five tanks daily. Then things got much worse for Russia when Ukraine began its counteroffensives in the east later in the year. The number of tank losses was then reported to be in the region of 10 tanks a day. These were T-72s, T-80s, and T-90s. Some of the T-62s that were destroyed or captured date back to the 70s, possibly even the 60s. Sure, the Ukrainians have lost a good number of their own tanks, but not anywhere near as many as the Russians, according to various sources in the Western media. The Russian media, of course, might put a different spin on things. No doubt both sides don't mind tweaking the numbers, that's war. But these tanks are proof that Russia has done extremely badly in the tank department. Ten tanks a day adds up to a lot. In October, Forbes wrote, that total tank losses for Russia stood at 1,392, with 801 of them destroyed and the others still being repairable. We found a report from a Ukrainian source that said the Russian tank losses were more like 2,573, although that story was published two weeks later. Other reports stated that some of the abandoned tanks were in tip-top condition, 
and still have surfaced because Ukrainian ammo could be used with them. Some were burned and busted with Russian soldiers still inside them, usually three of them. 6% of all Russian casualties in the war have been tank crews, according to one analyst. It must be a horrible way to die, being burned alive in a metal box. But it seems it's not out of the realm of possibility for a Russian soldier. Bear that in mind as we go on with the show. According to the website Global Firepower, Russia has a stock of 12,420 tanks and 30,122 armored vehicles. These numbers are for 2022, although we aren't sure if Global Firepower keeps updating the website since there are daily losses. Still, about 10,000 of the Russian tanks are in storage. For the ones being used, as you know, some are old, but some of them are modern iterations of the very able T-90. Now, we must ask why so many Russian tanks are decorating parts of Ukraine. If you were to ask an analyst, they might tell you it's complicated. They'll tell you that it's more than Russian tanks being obsolete in the battlefield. Let us explain. According to experts watching the war unfold, Russia has lost 237 T-72 B-3 tanks and hundreds more other iterations of T-72s that date back decades. The country has lost in the region of 170 T-80s, which were around the 1970s and were last built in 2001. So, yes, we have some pretty old tanks there. But there is more to the losses than many of the tanks perhaps not being modern enough for battle. The truth is, Russia has been using these tanks when they weren't needed or they deployed them clumsily. A military analyst based in the UK explained, tanks are supposed to fight as part of combined formations, but in terms of how they've been tactically used, Russia hasn't done that effectively. You see, tanks should be usually arriving on the battlefront when there is infantry and artillery close by to support them. Otherwise, close-range anti-tank missiles will take the tanks out easily. The best-case scenario for Russian tank crews? The Ukrainian anti-tank weapons and the people firing them would be destroyed or at least repulsed. This hasn't been happening anywhere near as often as Russian tank crews would like. We should also look at the billions of dollars the US and other countries are sending to Ukraine. A lot of the military aid consists of weapons that can easily destroy tanks, sometimes from a great distance, such as the US guided multiple launch rocket systems. In September, the New York Times wrote that these have already helped deplete Russian tank numbers. But these are for long-distance warfare. The US also supplies some arms to Ukraine used for close-quarters combat, including various anti-tank systems. The weapons sent from the US include hundreds of Javelin anti-armor systems, each costing about $250,000. These weapons hit the tanks from above where they're the weakest. They've been working out so far for Ukraine. The media reported the US has sent over to Ukraine 1,500 units of tube-launched optically-tracked wire-guided or tow anti-tank missiles. Along with those, plus the Javelins, the UK added a bunch of new-generation light anti-tank weapons. These short-range weapons can be easily transported on light-armored vehicles, and the US has sent millions of dollars worth of those over in its $54 billion package. So in terms of weapons, Ukraine right now is getting a lot of assistance. So, you have old tanks, sometimes traveling without enough support, going up against some of the most formidable anti-tank weaponry there is. Is it any wonder those Russian soldiers are leaving their tanks at the side of the street and running for their lives? All they really want in life is someone to love and friends to share the odd drink with. Being incinerated is hardly their ambition. This is important. The mental aspect, that is. This isn't the 1940s. Soldiers are not like they used to be, and their commanders are not anywhere near as brutal. Sacrificing oneself for your country seems like a raw deal these days. Although, it has to be said, back in the day, many Red Army soldiers hated Stalin and so weren't overly keen on fighting for him. Some are feeling that way now because, as we said, times have changed. Plus, some young men don't see Ukraine as a threat. Not a threat like the Nazis were. Some of them are more than willing to give up a hunk of their metal rather than be burned inside it. Some feel like they're being ordered around by idiots, pretty much sent to their deaths. As we said, the Russian war plan hasn't so far been great. Many news services are reporting about Russians who are no longer willing to fight. One of them told the BBC in May, I don't want to go back to Ukraine and kill and be killed. He explained, We were like blind kittens. I'm shocked by our army. It wouldn't cost much to equip us. Why wasn't it done? He said so often they were told to move forward without any previous reconnaissance and with no protection. He makes a good point. Many people have commented on how atrocious Russian strategic efforts have been. This year, the longtime political activist, among many things, Noam Chomsky talked about the utter incompetence of the Russian military. He's not alone in saying that. Scores of Russian soldiers who've been to the front line won't go back, and some who are there now are not willing to die. 
Some of them have seen traffic jams of tanks on roads when they were easily picked off by US and UK made shoulder fired anti tank weapons. A Russian tank crew named Alexei was there for one such attack, later explaining everyone in the crew was shell shocked. They had no idea what had hit them. This sounds like shooting fish in a barrel. What you have is inexperienced young men taking orders that even to them don't seem rational, moving around in old tanks against some of the best anti tank weapons in the world. It used to be that tanks were the best things for taking out tanks, but now these lightweight weapons seem to be able to do the job and Ukraine is being sent them all the time. The Moscow Times wrote that some of the tanks that date back to the 60s have been fitted with makeshift cages on the tops. It's hardly what you'd call modern armor. The tank crews have also tried putting sandbags and pine logs on top of their tanks, but this won't help their chances of survival in any significant way. This is why some people say the tank age is over. They say tanks these days are just too vulnerable. Still, maybe this just applies to the old tanks. Even so, old and new tanks should be protected with explosive reactive armor or ERA, which does what it sounds like it would do. There's also active armor which can sense incoming missiles and intercept them before they get to the tank. Why can't Russian tanks employ these features to defend themselves against missiles then? By the look of the battlefield, you'd think these tanks would struggle to react to an incoming tortoise. Even so, Russia has been a world leader in tank technology and armor technology, so why are its tanks being taken out so easily? Even though Russia has the know-how to stop it from happening, one analyst had this to say about that. The heavy attrition of Russian main battle tanks in Ukraine is highly likely partially due to Russia's failure to fit and properly employ adequate explosive reactive armor. It is highly likely that many Russian tank crews lack the training to maintain the ERA, leading to either poor fitting of the explosive elements of it or being left off entirely. So, this is more a human failure than it is a hardware failure, but it's more likely a bit of both. It might be down to money. Can Russia afford to protect its tanks the way they should be protected? Half the world is helping Ukraine in this war, and almost no one is helping Russia. Over $100 billion has been sent to aid Ukraine in total. The amount of weapons in those aid packages is staggering, way too many to list here. But be assured, the Western arms industry and its shareholders are having around-the-clock parties with by-the-minute champagne toasts just as Russian soldiers are being cooked alive by their weapons because no country is sending aid to Russia. But there's more. If you look at the video footage of Russian tanks being blown up, or if you take a close look at the dumped tanks, many of them have ERAs. Some don't, but that's probably because Ukrainians had already stripped them down. What does this mean? Well, firstly, there are various types of an ERA. Some are better than others. Also, ERA will help, but a strike can still be catastrophic. A missile can still lead to a deadly pop top, which means the turret is blown off. The sad fact is, for Russian soldiers, their armor is less effective than it should be eight times less effective than a NATO tank, according to one expert. This means that the catastrophic kill rate in Russian tanks, especially the older ones, is really high. With the older tanks, it's more than just poor ERA or poor ERA management, but the tank's other attributes that are less than desirable. But as we said, it's more than just hardware. If you ask any analyst right now who knows this war inside and out, they'll also tell you that crappy tactics and appalling morale among troops count for a lot when it comes to that deathly landscape of fallen tanks in Ukraine. As for substandard tactics, Russian tanks often do a follow-the-leader movement, and that has been leading to bunch-ups, the fish-in-a-barrel formation. We made that formation up, of course, but you know what we mean. On top of that, as we said, you have lackluster coordination with infantry and artillery, which is just asking for trouble. Russia has done this time and again. Their tanks have been huddled up, left out in the open like blind mice among well-armed pigeons and the majority of time they haven't even had the slightest bit of camouflage. The era of the tank may not be nigh, but if you think Russia has the time and money to redesign tanks to make them less vulnerable, you'd likely be wrong. Still, Hitler did once underestimate Russia's weapon building prowess. Right now, the worst job in the world has to be a Russian tank crew. If you listen to Putin, the war in Ukraine is going swimmingly, but some ominous signs point to a very different reality. What was boasted of as a few weeks war that would see Russia overrunning Kyiv has instead turned into a year-long quagmire that still has Russia fighting over the slice of Ukraine that they took in the early days, using countless soldiers and fast dwindling equipment to battle Ukrainian defenders over sparsely populated bombed-out cities like Bakhmut. But despite this, Putin has not taken his foot off the gas. In fact, he's gotten more belligerent than ever, frequently threatening NATO with direct retaliation. But for those reading the tea leaves, all the evidence is pointing to the fact that the Russian war effort may be reaching a disastrous turning point. 
The first indication that the war is going bad for Putin might be that he's increasingly belligerent again. He stepped up his threats against the West, claiming that every new step by NATO is risking nuclear war. But in terms of who's actually risking nuclear war, it's only him. In recent days, Putin announced the suspension of the last major nuclear weapons treaty between the US and Russia. New START, which took effect in 2011, only had three years left before it had to be renewed. But now Putin is pulling out effective immediately. This treaty allowed each country to obtain information on the other country's nuclear arsenal through inspection, and was part of a larger effort post-Cold War to prevent the uncontrolled growth of nuclear weapons. So what does this mean in practice? Experts say it's not the sign of strength Putin wants it to be. For one thing, Putin is now free to update his nuclear arsenal without any oversight. Russia has the world's largest nuclear arsenal, but that might be deceiving. Much like the US, Russia developed its nuclear arsenal during the Cold War, when the primary goal was to ensure mutually assured destruction between the two superpowers. If either one fired off a nuclear weapon, odds were that all life on Earth was going to die. That thankfully never happened, and the weapons just sat in storage for decades, waiting and biding their time. But that time might never come. Putin likes to threaten a nuclear first strike at every opportunity, but it's not clear if he could even pull it off. Nuclear weapons need to be inspected and maintained every few years to stay in working order. Not only have the Russian weapons been in storage for decades, but many of them were stored in regions of the Soviet Union that are now independent countries, including Russia. It's not clear how many Russian weapons are even still in working order, or how many experts there are in maintaining Soviet-era weapons. The US, which is vastly wealthier than Russia, has publicly admitted trouble in keeping its own massive stockpile properly maintained and recently allocated billions into a modernization program, so it's doubtful Russia has managed to keep its own even bigger arsenal in good working order. Now Putin has a reason to want new and modern weapons. It's possible that his withdrawal from the New START treaty might just be a game of brinksmanship and intimidation, but it's also possible that Putin is planning to ramp up production on a modern wave of nukes. However, there are some mixed signals on that front. Only a few days after withdrawing from the treaty, Putin clarified that it was only a partial withdrawal and would not lead to the design of new weapons. This means that the only point of the move was to make Westerners even more scared about the possibility of nuclear war, a fear that Putin uses to manipulate the West into self-deterrence. Of course, like many things about the war, what Putin says and what he does might be very different. If Putin had the chance to add new and more powerful nuclear weapons that didn't date back 40 years to his arsenal, the odds are he would jump at the chance, but he's not which indicates it might be yet another area where Russia is being frozen out. It's well known that Russia is more isolated than ever before, with most of the world sanctioning Russia and cutting it off from the global economy. Its only consistent allies are its satellite state Belarus, fellow outlaw states Iran, North Korea and Venezuela, and a few stray countries like Nicaragua and Mali that back it up at the UN. And even a few of those countries are hesitant to back it fully. Russia's been burning through its military equipment quickly, with NATO weapons and a determined Ukrainian military tearing through the Cold War era equipment. That has limited Russia to getting new weapons from its few remaining allies, with only Iran and North Korea having the arsenal needed to provide them with suitable weapons. But there is one wild card in the picture, China. Chinese leader Xi Jinping opened the war by emphasizing China's alliance with Putin, and most analysts viewed China as likely a long-term ally due to them having a vested interest in the age of conquest returning. After all, if Putin conquered Ukraine and the world grudgingly accepted it, China would have a good chance of conquering Taiwan without global intervention. Needless to say, it did not work out that way. As the war ground on and it became clear Russia would not be overrunning Kyiv anytime soon, China started hedging its bets on whether they would aid Russia. During a recent United Nations vote calling on Russia to leave Ukraine, China abstained. Hardly a vote of confidence. But despite this, reports keep leaking out that China could be on the verge of giving Russia lethal weapons. Yet, they're always on the verge and never seem to take this step, at least as of February 2023. Instead, China continues to try to portray itself as a rational, neutral actor, even offering to mediate a peace deal with terms that were widely mocked by the West. So, why aren't they willing to aid another of the US's long-term rivals? Simply put, right now, backing Russia looks like a losing proposition. There's no indication that Russia is truly turning the corner, and China has heavy investments in the rest of the world. And while China has largely thumbed its nose at international law, the US does have one massive piece of leverage against it here, 
Secondary sanctions. These sanctions target non-U.S. persons or institutions that do business with a party under sanctions. This is usually used to target those doing business with Iran, but it could easily be expanded to those doing business with Russia if China decides to get more directly involved. And if China is going to risk that, it's definitely not going to be for a losing war. And it may not be in China's best interests right now. Analysts say that if China decides to give lethal aid to Russia, it would formally transform Ukraine into a proxy war and essentially kick off a full Cold War between the US and China, one that could easily turn hot. And if that's going to happen, China wants it to be on its timeline. That means Russia is largely on its own as it enters the next phase of the war. But Putin is acting as confident as ever. He's looking to intimidate the world, announcing a ramp up in weapons and likely mobilization to try to push deeper into Ukrainian territory. But neither of these might work out how he's hoping. Another bad sign for Putin came shortly after he announced the withdrawal from the New START treaty. As Russia attempted to test a new intercontinental ballistic missile, there was clearly an attempt to intimidate the West and remind them that Russia could still hit them anywhere and at any time. Except that seemed like they really couldn't. The RS-28 Sarmat missile, known as the Satan II, could carry a 10-ton payload, but reportedly failed at liftoff this time. Russian media, of course, made no mention of the test, but insiders reported that it was yet another black eye for Russia. And it may not be the only area where things are collapsing. Russia has been heavily rumored to be preparing for a spring mobilization and surge full of shock and awe, designed to finish off the last of Ukrainian defenders in the east and begin the process of retaking the Black Sea and pushing toward Kyiv. But in recent weeks, the noise had quieted down, and while more Russian troops are flooding into Ukraine, they're mostly clustered around Bakhmut, where the Russians are slowly grinding down the opposition, but losing far more troops in the process, which means Russia will need more troops, and soon. During the last mobilization, Russia resorted to a draft, which led to the biggest anti-war protests the country had ever seen. The mobilization was largely seen as a disaster, as Russia relied heavily on ethnic minority groups, often drafting young professionals with no military experience and sending them to the front lines with only weeks of training, and got little for its efforts besides more war dead. So this time, Putin is taking a different approach, conducting what's being called a silent mobilization. The first draft is still technically in effect, but this wave seems to be conducted in small dribs and drabs to avoid public attention. This is probably the biggest sign yet that Putin realizes the public is no longer on his side, and for the first time, he's acting like it matters. But the biggest sign that the wheels are coming off the car for Putin might be happening not in Ukraine or Russia. In recent weeks, the discourse over the war has shifted away from the two warring countries to tiny Moldova, a former Soviet republic bordering Ukraine and Romania. While it doesn't border Russia, Russia actually does have a beachhead in the country, the region of Transnistria, a breakaway region that seeks independence with Russian backing. There are even Russian troops in the region, troops that could be used to surge into Ukraine and open a new front in the war. But right now, Moldova is concerned about something else. In recent weeks, Moldova saw its government collapse and Russian missiles fly over the small country. This was seen as part of a plot by Russia to collapse the government and replace the pro-Western leadership with a pro-Putin flag. But it failed utterly, as President Maya Sandu not only appointed a new pro-Western prime minister, but openly accused Putin of being behind a coup attempt and met with Ukrainian leader Vladimir Zelensky to share details of Russia's plotting in the region. In the days after, Sandu reached out to NATO and the West for support, bringing the country closer to formally joining the alliance. Which means that the West isn't just aware of Putin's actions, they're not afraid of him anymore. In the past, Putin's intimidation has meant that he's able to run roughshod over the independence of former Soviet republics. The international community watched as he annexed Crimea with impunity and interfered in the politics of border nations repeatedly. They assumed that by letting him get away with it, it would keep him from embarking on a full war of conquest, which was proven wrong in Ukraine. Putin's goal of launching the war was creating a new world order, one where he could hold all of Europe at nuclear blackmail and begin recollecting the countries of the old Soviet Union. But that only happens when you win. The biggest sign that the war is going badly for Putin isn't that he's loudly withdrawing from treaties or quietly calling up soldiers without a full draft or begging China for help. It's that the invasion of Ukraine was largely designed to punish Ukraine for getting too close to the West and warn other countries from doing the same. Instead, more people are lining to join up than ever before, and a new world order is being shaped with Putin on the outside looking in.
Crimea, the flashpoint for the ongoing invasion of Ukraine. But how did the gesture that was meant to show the quote, boundless trust and love the Russian people feel toward the Ukrainian people end up as the catalyst for the slaughter of Ukrainians at Russian hands? The stage for today's war between Ukraine and Russia was set in the late 1700s. The Crimean Peninsula had been under the rule of the Crimean Khanate for 300 years and was the longest surviving splinter of Genghis Khan's once powerful Golden Horde. The peninsula was bordered by both Russia and the Ottoman Empires, but the presence of a significant number of Turkic Crimean Tatars brought the peninsula under the influence of the Ottomans. In 1768, Western Europe was experiencing a period of weakness after the Seven Years' War, and an increasingly powerful Russia took advantage of the situation to impose its influence on Poland. Guerrilla war soon broke out, though Russian troops managed to suppress most of the uprisings. One group managed to slip away from the Russian troops by crossing over the border into the Ottoman Empire. The Cossacks pursuing them paid no heed to the borders and followed to the town of Balta, where they massacred everyone. Shortly after, war broke out between Russia and the Ottomans. The Ottoman Empire was beset by infighting, though, and while technically the superior force with a superior tactical position thanks to their control of the Black Sea, Russia would end up the victor six years later. This marked the rise of Russia as a major European power, and in the peace negotiations that followed, Western Europe states worked to limit the terms of the peace treaty so as to prevent Russia from gaining too much influence in the East. Crimea, however, was annexed by Russia and soon heavily colonized by both Russians and Ukrainians, though with a population that was ultimately mostly Russian. In 1853, Russia once more went to war with the declining Ottoman Empire. Britain and France joined in on the side of the Ottomans to prevent Russia from gaining too much influence over breakaway states of the ever-declining Ottoman Empire. Much of the fighting would take place in Crimea, hence the war earning the name the Crimean War, and it would leave the peninsula devastated economically. Russian persecution of Crimean Tatars led to many being killed or forced to flee the Ottoman Empire, with the Russians ending the practice only because too much farmland was being left unattended. Despite being the focus of much of the fighting, the peninsula remained in Russian hands though. Having lost the war, the Russian Empire went into a decades-long period of decline during which it sought to reinvent itself so as to remain its former status as a major European power. For Crimea though, life would remain largely the same until the Russian Civil War of 1917. Prompted by increasing dissatisfaction over the domestic condition in Russia and a disastrous involvement in World War I, the Russian Revolution began with the Tsar stepping down from power, believing that his removal would calm the ever-increasing social unrest. In his place, the Russian Duma was formed, which was made up of prominent capitalists as well as the Russian nobility and aristocracy. This, however, did not sit well with many people. Though liberated from serfdoms decades before, their liberation had come with vast stipulations that heavily favored the nobility that once lorded over them. The common people thus distrusted the Duma and banded together into Soviets, grassroots community assemblies that sought to bring political power to the lower classes through unity. For a time, the Duma ruled alongside the Soviets, with the Duma in control of the military and international affairs and the Soviets wielding great influence over domestic affairs. With the allegiance of much of the working class and middle classes, the Soviets were too powerful for the Duma to simply disband by force or ignore. Amongst the Soviets was the quickly growing Bolshevik faction, headed by Vladimir Lenin, who campaigned on the slogan of peace, land, and bread. He wished to end the disastrous war against Germany, give land belonging to the nobles to the peasantry, and end the famine caused by Russia's losing war. With thousands of demoralized soldiers coming home from the Eastern Front, the Bolsheviks quickly grew in popularity, and support for the war dwindled. Finally, tensions exploded with the October Revolution, during which the Bolshevik forces stormed Petrograd and overthrew the provisional government, leaving them in power over all of Russia. However, not everyone in Russia accepted Bolshevik rule, prompting the Russian Civil War. Russia split into whites and reds, with the white factions consisting of capitalists, imperialists, wishing to see the Tsar restored to power, and various other political factions all supported by the West, who hoped that a white victory would return Russia to the war and continue to put pressure on Germany. Crimea became a stronghold for the White Army thanks to its access to the Black Sea, which allowed for easy resupply from Western allies. The peninsula would swap hands multiple times, though, as the bloody war progressed, making it one of the bloodiest places in all of Russia at the time. However, as the war turned against the Whites, Crimea would be where they'd make their last stand in 1920. After being defeated, any surviving Whites fled to Istanbul and beyond. 50,000 White prisoners of war and civilians would end up massacred after the defeat of the White Army. 
1921, the Crimean Autonomous Soviet Socialist Republic was created and officially joined with the Soviet Union. Despite claimed autonomy, though, Crimea remained very much in control of the Soviet Union, and autonomy did not protect its population from Joseph Stalin's repressions. With tensions rising in the peninsula, Stalin took advantage of the natural famine and worsened it on purpose so as to starve millions of rebellious Ukrainians, including many in Crimea. Crimea would once more become the site of atrocities during the German invasion of the Soviet Union in the Second World War. Crimea was highly sought after by the Germans due to its beauty and fertility, and was seen as a crown jewel to be seized and handed over to the German colonists after the war. Thus, it became the site of many of the war's bloodiest battles, until finally falling to the Germans. Despite brutal reprisals, though, the Germans were never able to secure the mountainous areas from a partisan movement that lasted until they themselves were finally expelled by Russian forces. Stalin, however, had his own plans for the ethnic cleansing of Crimea and followed German persecutions of locals and especially Jews with its forced deportation of Crimean Tatars. The Tatars had their land seized from them and forcibly deported to Central Asia in a bid to destroy them culturally. The Armenians, Bulgarians, and Greeks would follow suit, leaving mostly Russians and Ukrainians behind. The Crimean Autonomous Soviet Socialist Republic was also abolished in 1945, with the peninsula being made officially a part of the Russian Soviet Federative Socialist Republic. In 1954, though the Crimean Peninsula was officially returned to the Ukrainian Republic via a decree from the Presidium of the Supreme Soviet. In a front-page announcement on the official newspaper of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, Pravda, the decree read, On April 26, 1954, the decree of the Presidium of the USSR Supreme Soviet transferring the Crimean Oblast from the Russian SFSR to the Ukrainian SSR. Taking into account the integral character of the economy, the territorial proximity, and the close economic and cultural ties between the Crimean province and the Ukrainian SSR, the Presidium of the USSR Supreme Soviet decrees to approve the joint presentation of the Presidium of the Russian SFSR Supreme Soviet and the Presidium of the Ukrainian SSR Supreme Soviet on the transfer of the Crimean province from the Russian SFSR to the Ukrainian SSR. The reason for the transfer of the strategically important peninsula to Ukraine was described as a symbolic gesture, marking the 300th anniversary of the 1654 Treaty of Pereyaslav. However, this doesn't hold up to scrutiny as Pereyaslav is in central Ukraine and nowhere near Crimea, and neither did the treaty affect the peninsula itself. Symbolically, the Communist Party was trying to portray the treaty as the unification between Ukrainians and Russians. But while the treaty was a major step in that direction, plenty of violence remained before Ukrainians and Russians would consider themselves brothers. The real reasons are numerous. Nina Khrushcheva, political scientist and great-granddaughter of Nikita Khrushchev, believed that the transfer of the peninsula to the Ukrainian people was partially symbolic, partially an effort to reshuffle the centralized political system, and also because Khrushchev had always been fond of Ukraine. She believed that it was a gesture from her great-grandfather to what was his favorite republic. However, Sergei Khrushchev, son of Nikita Khrushchev, claimed that the decision was due to the building of a hydroelectric dam on the Dnieper River and a desire for the administration of the Ukrainian territory to be under a single body. Thus, ceding the peninsula back to the Ukrainian Republic was a measure of convenience. Other reasons, though, include the integration of the Ukrainian and Crimean economies and the belief that Crimea was a natural extension of the Ukrainian steppes. There was even some desire to repopulate Crimea with Slavs after the expulsions of the Crimean Tatars by Stalin in 1944. One effect of the transfer, however, was the unifying of the Ukrainian and Russian people. Savatopol in Crimea was the home of the Soviet Black Sea Fleet and an all-important naval base for the Soviets, through which they could influence the Black Sea and the Mediterranean and beyond. By transferring the peninsula, it bound Ukraine closer to Russia, and even the 1954 posters announcing the event ran with the slogan, Eternally Together. Whatever the reasons, the transferring of the peninsula did indeed bring the Russian and Ukrainian people closer together, resulting in great benefit to both. However, as the Soviet Union began to disintegrate in 1989, Ukraine declared its independence shortly after, taking Crimea along with it. This suddenly put the Russian Navy in a very disadvantageous position in the Black Sea, further impacting its ability to influence the Mediterranean. Vladimir Putin vowed to resolve that situation and took advantage of a political strife in Ukraine in 2014 to forcibly annex the peninsula. Putin claimed that he was merely responding to the request of a majority Russian population to be part of the Russian Federation. Crimea would end up emboldening Putin, however, and fueling his support for breakaway republics in eastern Ukraine. Claims were made that these republics too contained a majority of citizens who wanted to rejoin Russia, and public referendums were held that showed support in favor of leaving Ukraine. 
though these results were immediately disputed since no independent sources were allowed to verify the voting and the results weren't recognized by either the Ukrainian government or any UN member countries. This only added to the tension of the ongoing Russo-Ukrainian war, which has now lasted until at least 2022, and following Putin's decision to invade all of Ukraine, it doesn't appear to be ending anytime soon. What happens next in Ukraine is anyone's guess, though the current invasion is going disastrously for Russia. And in just the first two weeks of fighting, Russia lost more men and equipment than the United States did in 20 years of fighting in Iraq and Afghanistan. Even if Russia succeeds in defeating the Ukrainian military, it's impossible for its army to secure the entire country against a raging insurgency hell-bent on expelling Russian troops from their native soil. With so much political goodwill destroyed between Russia and Ukraine, and with the blacklisting of Russia internationally, along with the staggering losses in lives and equipment, even if Russia wins in Ukraine, it will still have lost the war. It's pretty obvious Russia is losing the war in Ukraine, however, simply stating Russia is losing the war doesn't do justice just to how bad the Russian military is performing. Here are five ways that show how Russia is losing big in Ukraine. Number 1. Manpower and Equipment Losses Without a doubt, one of the best ways to see how a nation is performing in a war is by looking at casualties. Generally speaking, the side that suffers more casualties is the one that ends up losing. While history is filled with examples that go against this philosophy, like Vietnam or the war in Afghanistan, it generally holds true. The war in Ukraine is no different. Though exact figures are still classified, and the world will never know the actual figures due to fog of war, we still have a pretty good idea of how much carnage this war is causing. In November 2022, the Pentagon and United Kingdom released similar estimates on casualty figures. According to these military officials, the Ukrainians have suffered about 100,000 casualties, while the Russians have suffered at least 100,000 casualties. In defining casualties, these figures include those killed, wounded, missing, and captured. These figures probably do not include accidents, illness, and desertions, which have plagued the Russian military since the start of the invasion. Even though these figures are relatively similar, the casualty gap is widening rapidly. According to the Ukrainian government, the Russian army suffered almost seven casualties for every Ukrainian casualty during the offensive to take Kherson. Additionally, as the war grinds on, new Russian soldiers coming to the front are of poorer quality than their Ukrainian counterparts. Media reports are full of stories of how Russian civilians are taken off the street with little to no training. It's clear from the plethora of first-hand accounts that the Russian military does not have the time or budget to train new troops properly. As a result, Russian soldiers meant to serve as replacements are of far lesser quality than the troops whose spots they're taking. The opposite is happening in the Ukrainian military. While there were literally hundreds of thousands of citizen soldiers rushed to the front line in the chaotic first weeks of the war, that has largely subsided. Now the Ukrainian armed forces enjoy world-class training from NATO countries abroad before going into the fight. That means that as time goes on, the individual Ukrainian soldier will become deadlier than their Russian counterpart. The heavy casualties also apply to Russian equipment. Though the loss of personnel is only slightly in favor of Ukraine, the difference between the two in loss of equipment is staggering. As of the end of November, Russia has lost over 8,000 pieces of equipment, almost four times the documented number of Ukrainian equipment lost. While gear, like aircraft and helicopters, remain about the same, losses in tanks, infantry fighting vehicles, artillery, and trucks among the Russian military are staggering. In particular, the loss of tanks has become so bad for Russia that it's had numerous long-term effects on its military. Over the past 20 years, Russia has faced delays in super tank programs like the T-14 Armada in favor of upgrading existing vehicles like the T-72 tank. Even though these upgrades cost far less than building an armada, most of these upgrade packages relied on imports from Western arms manufacturers. With embargoes in place, the Russian defense industry is severely limited in the amount of upgraded or newer tanks it can produce. As Ukraine destroys more Russian armor, the vehicles that replace them become older and less capable. On the other hand, Ukraine enjoys a robust arms industry thanks to NATO refitting, rearming, and rebuilding its tanks. Countries like Germany and Poland provide depots for Ukrainian armed vehicles to be rebuilt or refurbished with the latest tech before returning to the fight. Number 2. Money before the war started, there could be no comparison between Ukraine's economy and Russia's. Russia's economy was the 11th biggest in the world and over 10 times the size of Ukraine's. Additionally, Russia had the advantage of being the largest gas supplier in Europe, meaning that its military would have unlimited cheap fuel to run its war machines. However, it appears that war is costing Russia far more than expected. 
Recently released Russian economic data shows that the conflict cost Russia one quarter of its entire annual budget in the first nine months of the war, and the war still has another month to close out the year. To put that in perspective, analysts estimate that the war costs Russia $15.5 million per hour. The economic strain this has put on the Russian military and society is huge. Not only have sources of advanced military hardware been dried up because of sanctions, but even if they were available, the Russian military could not afford to pay for them. Because of this, Russia has increasingly turned toward Iran and North Korea to supply its military with advanced weaponry, missiles, spare parts, and artillery shells. They're doing so because the Russian government does not have the money to pay for the gear it needs. Such drastic shortages of cash are seen even at the individual soldier level. The cash-strapped Russian government cannot even afford basic necessities for its troops like food, water, clothing, and ammunition. An actual salary is completely out of the question. In fact, the Russian federal government is so broke that it's ordered the local oblasts and republics that make up the Russian Federation to help shoulder the cost. It would be the equivalent in the United States of Congress asking each state to fork over money from state budgets to go toward the war effort. Such spending is ultimately unsustainable. Compared to Ukraine, Russia cannot compete. With military, humanitarian, and economic aid coming in from around the world, the Russian economy can't compete with the size and scale of the international community. Number 3. Losing the Information War At the beginning of the war, Putin claimed that Russia was invading Ukraine because the government was committing crimes against humanity against the Russian people in the Donbass. Of course, this has proven to be a total lie. Throughout the course of the war, the Ukrainian government has been open and transparent about what's been going on. Media outlets and various international bodies are allowed routine, uninterrupted access to all parts of the territory under Ukrainian control. It's clear that Ukraine never carried out atrocities against its civilians. On the contrary, places like Bucha, Kharkiv, and Mariupol show that Russia is the one committing crimes against humanity. Russia also claimed that the Nazis controlled the government and that the Russian military needed to denazify Ukraine. However, Russian soldiers realized that there were never any Nazis in Ukraine. As reported throughout the country, local populations were incredibly hostile to Russian troops. To many a Russian surprise, they were not seen as liberators, but as occupiers. Such a realization has caused many Russians to doubt the reality of why they are fighting the war in the first place. Another way Russia has lost the information war is by claiming that Ukraine was going to invade Russia and that the Russian invasion was to prevent that from happening. To bolster this claim, Russian media reports have stated that Russian service members are briefed on supposedly classified Ukrainian documents that outline a full-scale invasion of Russia. However, first-hand accounts from social media show that Russian troops realized this was a lie when they got to the country. In fact, the best way Russia has lost the information war has been through what it hasn't done. Families of Russian troops killed, missing, or forcibly mobilized complain bitterly of treatment by military authorities. Lack of payment, lack of transparency, and no communication means families are left in the dark about their loved ones and their future. This lack of compassion by the Russian authorities toward the families of its troops has cost the Russian government the moral high ground among its people. Number 4. Failure to Gain Air Superiority before the war started, people expected that the Russian military would completely knock the Ukrainian Air Force out of the sky within a week. But to the world's surprise, the Ukrainian Air Force has not only survived, but remains a viable combat effective force, retaining about 80% of its capability. How the Ukrainian Air Force has survived for so long has largely been due to ingenuity. As a general rule, Russian aircraft are more advanced and their pilots have more flight hours than their Ukrainian counterparts. But unlike Russian pilots, Ukrainian pilots and ground crew have much better morale. They also have better problem-solving skills. Knowing that Air Force bases would become prime targets for ballistic missile strikes, the Ukrainian Air Force stayed on the move. Mobile repair shops and maintenance depots operate out of trucks. Ukrainian fighter jets stay hidden in forests only to be trucked into open highways where they can take off. Russian Air Force bases tend to stay in fixed locations, becoming prime targets for missile and drone strikes throughout the war. But it's not only Ukraine's ingenuity that's prevented Russia from taking control of the skies, its massive air defense network has also helped. Though Ukraine has received some modern air defense systems like the NASAMS, these have been received in small quantities. Even though these Western systems are deadly and have performed well, they have yet to make a strategic difference. What has made a strategic difference has been the blanket of vintage Soviet systems, radar, and man pads. 
Because Ukraine knew its air force would always be on its back foot, it heavily invested in building a robust air defense network, using a combination of legacy Soviet equipment and a literal flood of manpad systems like Stinger missiles, the Ukrainians have built one of the world's most robust air defense networks. Whether they're facing fighters, drones, or missiles, Ukrainian air defenses regularly shoot down most inbound Russian contacts. Their air defense network is so good that Russian aircraft stopped attempting to conduct strategic strikes in April. In fact, the few times Russian aircraft are spotted in battle is when they're used for close air support for its ground troops. Because of this, Russia relies on drones and ballistic missiles to conduct strategic strikes for anything past the immediate front lines. Number 5. Loss of the Black Sea when Russia illegally annexed Crimea back in 2014, it seized the majority of the Ukrainian Navy. During the first few weeks of the 2022 invasion, what remained of the Ukrainian Navy was captured or scuttled by naval personnel to prevent their capture. Even though Ukraine doesn't have a navy anymore, they still have the ability to carry out a series of impressive attacks against the world's third largest naval power. Back in March, ballistic missiles sunk one amphibious transport ship and severely damaged two others in Berdyansk. In April, the flagship of the Russian fleet, the Moskva, was sunk by two surface-to-surface -surface missiles. In October, a barrage of Ukrainian unmanned surface vessels struck the home port of the Black Sea Fleet and occupied Sevastopol, and the new Russian flagship and a minesweeper were damaged. These attacks are just a few examples of the pummeling Ukraine has given to the Russian Navy. Though the losses might seem insignificant compared to the Russian Army's losses, they are just as bad. Because Ukraine has demonstrated they can strike Russian ships anytime and anywhere in the Black Sea, their movement is severely limited. In fact, since the October attack in Sevastopol, it appears most of the Black Sea fleet is tucked away inside the port. The Russians did this because the army could protect the ships with shore-based anti-aircraft and missile defenses. Such a move proves just how vulnerable Russian ships are on the open ocean and how ineffective their crews are at defending themselves. It appears that all operational ships are now being based out of Novorossiysk. This port is the largest Russian port on the Black Sea. However, forcing the Russian Black Sea fleet to use this port severely hurts its combat power. Because this port is much further than Sevastopol from mainland Ukraine, Russian ships can spend fewer days in active combat. This is due to their limited endurance because Russian ships cannot underway replenish as NATO ships can. The further distance also places many of the advanced weapon systems, like caliber missiles, at the maximum extent of their range. Change. Because of this, Russian ships cannot strike Ukrainian cities with impunity, and the few targets in their range would be hit with a margin of inaccuracy. Ultimately, because of the effectiveness of Ukrainian attacks, they've all but denied the Russian Navy freedom of movement in the Black Sea and removed it as an effective fighting force. Vladimir Putin is sitting in his office, his top lip curled into a snarl. He's just been given his armed forces tanks inventory. The losses are staggering. The Russians were losing about 5 tanks a day earlier in the year, but it increased to 10 tanks a day after Ukraine's counteroffensives in the east and west. Legions of T-72s, T-80s, and T-90s have been destroyed. It's a nightmare for Putin. To suffer losses like that, the opposing side must have formidable weapons. As luck would have it, Ukraine has no shortage of them thanks to the West. The US providing aid to Ukraine is hardly anything new. The Ukraine-Russia-US story is a long and complicated one as to how these nations have interacted with each other, overtly and covertly, in recent years and long before the war. US help has been there for the right people for a while. Russia has also grown its influence in Ukraine and it's been that way, well, for a long time. In 2014, the U.S. helped overthrow Ukraine's elected president, with Assistant Secretary of State Victoria Nuland even being caught on the phone handpicking a new Ukrainian leader. So, when we talk about U.S. aid to Ukraine, it's a convoluted story going back way before the Russian invasion. The tale has many sides, which anyone paying taxes should arguably understand. The Russians have repeatedly said that the U.S. has been dictating things behind the scenes, which has resulted in what they say is nothing more than a proxy war. The U.S. has accused Russia of flagrant abuse of powers. Up until recently, Ukraine didn't take that much newspaper space, and when it was talked about, it was often in a positive light. Corruption and neo-Nazis often filled the stories. Now Putin is using neo-Nazi propaganda as justification for the invasion. There's the so-called realist account, as provided by the American political scientist John Mearsheimer, who believes the U.S. has orchestrated the war for its own selfish reasons, pushing the world closer to a nuclear catastrophe. Mearsheimer doesn't get invited to many parties these days. He hasn't been on CNN for eons. 
Holding that view can make you a lot of enemies in the US and Ukraine. It'll get you called a Putin propagandist, especially when you say something like Mearsheimer told The New Yorker recently, we are going to blame the Russians, so we invented the story that Russia was bent on aggression in Eastern Europe. Mearsheimer is just one of the many vastly unpopular political experts who think the US has been pulling all the strings to cause havoc to Russia. They still think Putin is wrong, though. They still blame him for what he has done. You'd have many more friends if you espoused another view, the corporate media view for the most part, which is that Putin won't stop until he's satisfied that Russia is as great as it was in the past. That Putin is the epitome of evil. He's out of control. He won't stop until Russia has built a new Russian empire, which is why he needs to be stopped, which is why Ukraine needs billions in aid paid for by all you taxpaying citizens. So, in some sense, this is why the US can give so much aid and for the most part its citizens are okay with it. It's the same in other countries such as the UK, even if it is struggling right now. Today we're going to talk more about how the US is aiding Ukraine in a practical sense and we'll leave out all the small print of the why part. Neither will we try to understand what Vladimir Putin is thinking. We will just say this though, we don't want to celebrate weapons and war. We don't want to make this show sound like weapon worship. The biggest losers in this conflict are the soldiers dying on both sides and the civilians suffering in large numbers. We only hope they'll find some amount of peace soon. As you'll see at the end, this could be wishful thinking. When you get to that end, if you pick a winner, you'll probably say the arms industry, the BAE systems of this world, the Lockheed Martins, the Northrop Grumman's, the Raytheon's, their shareholders are also winning, which happen to include some members of Congress and some members of the UK Parliament. You can't ignore that either when it comes to aid. Over $100 billion in aid to Ukraine has been spent so far by all countries, but expect that to shoot up as the weeks and months pass. Most of it has been and will be military aid. It's not all about weapons, though. It's about food, clothing, infrastructure, and more. This is humanitarian aid, after all. If you add up all the aid provided by the US, the New York Times says the package is $54 billion, but that was back in May. Things have changed since then, as you'll soon see. Still, that number is more or less correct. Just to put matters into perspective, last year the US government spent $43 billion on highway grants, $63 billion on public housing, $260 billion on education, and $56 billion on health insurance premium tax credits. You might now think the US's $54 billion is an immense amount, but in terms of their GDPs, Estonia, Latvia, and Poland have spent more than the US on Ukraine aid. In order, Lithuania, the UK, and Canada came after the US. In terms of US aid, $12.5 billion has gone to providing weapons or other supplies, $9.4 billion has gone to economic aid, and $6 billion on military and security assistance, $7 billion to food assistance and healthcare, $4.7 billion on grants and loans for military supplies, and $8.1 billion on military deployments and intelligence. It's surprising how many countries are helping out Ukraine. The number is around 50. We bet you didn't know that Argentina has just sent 1,700 tons of foodstuffs, medicine, and clothing to Ukraine. Bulgaria has also just sent over 2,000 helmets and 2,000 bulletproof vests. But tens of millions in aid is coming from many other nations, and for the wealthier ones, the aid is in the billions. France has sent Ukraine some top-notch military equipment, and we're talking about enough weapons and machinery to start a small war. It's the same with the UK. It sent a whole host of weapons to Ukraine, including thousands of anti-armor weapons and Javelin anti-tank missiles. It spent $54 million alone on Ukraine-bound Black Hornet nano drones. God only knows how they'll be used. We told you business was booming for the arms industry. Revenues have shot up, records are being broken, as heads, legs, and chests are blown asunder. The profits of the people that make it possible have literally never been so good. In terms of raw numbers, the US is not only the biggest aid provider to Ukraine right now, followed by the UK, Poland, and Germany, but it's the biggest provider of military aid to nations worldwide. While humanitarian aid pales in comparison, the US is also the world leader in that regard. 8.2 billion for 2021, followed by Germany at 1.8 billion, the EU at 1.5 billion, and the UK at 840 million. The US's military aid comes from the budget of the Department of Defense, which as you know is a huge budget. It's 722 billion for 2022, and the DoD has requested that to be raised to 813 billion for 2023. The US defense budget started to increase drastically in 2001 when it was $331 billion. In 2005, it reached $533 billion. It wasn't even $100 billion in the late 60s and early 70s when the US was fighting in Vietnam and secretly bombing the hell out of Laos and Cambodia. Still, in terms of inflation, the 1969 defense budget would be $679 billion in today's money. We'll talk about some new numbers soon, but first, we need to ask how the US actually sends so many weapons to Ukraine. 
We mean in logistical terms, the answer is twofold. One way is by air. For instance, the US's giant air transport planes can transport an insane amount, with the Super Galaxy being able to carry 130 tons of equipment. That means you could pack it with two M1A2 Abrams main battle tanks, or as many as 10 armored vehicles, or perhaps 16 high-mobility multi-purpose wheeled vehicles, aka Humvees. Having a few military transport planes flying every week will help, but in August 2022, the Washington Post said the Pentagon was expanding its use of maritime shipping. The Pentagon obviously won't say what routes those ships will be using, but did say that many of the weapons will go straight to Ukraine, while others will add to stocks already in other European countries. We guess you can now see why Russia has been losing so many tanks. It seems the entire world has Ukraine's back. Even China, which some say is taking the side of Russia, has remained neutral and isn't sending Russia any military aid. The bad news, or the very worst news, would be if things got nuclear, because Russia could hold its own. That's scary, and some analysts don't count out nuclear war. Now let's look at some of the weapons the US has already sent to Ukraine. At the top of the list, we'll put the 1400 or so Stinger anti-aircraft systems. Anti-aircraft weapons have been very useful and have already taken out a number of aircraft on both sides. On October 1st, an anti-air missile shot a Russian Ka-52 attack helicopter to pieces in Zaporizhia Oblast, but we can't say exactly what weapon was used. The US has also sent about 8500 Javelin anti-armor systems. News reports tell us that these things have been partly responsible for all the damage to Russian tanks that we talked about in the intro. Raytheon and Lockheed Martin have been busy making these things while the US sent around 32,000 units of different types of anti-armor systems. The list of weapons goes on and on, but let's just mention a few more things that have been sent already. One package included 20 Mi-17 helicopters. On top of this, there were 200 Max Pro mine-resistant ambush-protected vehicles, eight National Advanced Surface-to-Air Missile Systems, hundreds of armored high-mobility multi-purpose wheeled vehicles, and 200 M113 armored personnel carriers. Then you have things such as counter-unmanned aerial systems, air surveillance radars, patrol boats, night vision devices, thermal imagery systems, satellite imagery systems, cold weather gear, electronic jamming equipment, explosive ordnance disposal protective gear, and much more. It's still not enough, according to the US media. Some more recent items talked about in the media that we think are part of the $54 billion budget include artillery and coastal defense weapons, ammunition for the artillery, and a bunch more advanced rocket systems. Now, we imagine you can really understand Russia's tank problem. Analysts are saying that the recent losses for Russia have been nothing short of astounding. On October 19th, the country lost 1,392 tanks, 801 were destroyed, and the rest were just abandoned or were taken without being hit. Ukraine has also lost tanks, but not anywhere near as many. We should also add that Russia hasn't reported its losses, though the news comes from the Western media. Never mind how cynical you think it sounds, you should always question what's reported in terms of wins and losses in wars. Throughout modern history, the numbers have been cooked up with propaganda to placate and buck up the public. We're not saying that's the case here, but just bear that in mind. Russia will be doing the same, of course. It doesn't help that Russia has been using tanks from the 60s and 70s. The T-62 is so old that one of the abandoned tanks was found and inside it someone has written, I hate Nixon. Just kidding, but you get the idea. Modern tanks are far less exposed than older ones. According to Forbes, Ukraine now has quite the collection of captured T-62s. As for what Ukraine wants more of, not long ago it put in a request for high-mobility artillery rocket systems. These things, which will set you back about $3.8 million apiece, come from Lockheed Martin, are incredibly useful despite some reports of civilian casualties. Some members of the Taliban might also have been hurt, of course, although according to the International Security Assistance Force, the rockets were 300 meters off their targets. Despite the misses, military experts called HIMARS indispensable, or as one website said, combat-proven all-weather 24-7 lethal and responsive weapons. And that's why Ukraine has them on its Christmas list. As part of that same package, the US said it would also send some M777 howitzers, 18 of them, each weighing in at $3.7 million created by the British company BAE Systems. Recently, Ukraine said it needed longer-range weapons since Russia already had them. Obviously, it doesn't help if the enemy can hit you from further away. A Ukrainian presidential advisor explained it's hard to fight when you're attacked from 70 kilometers away and have nothing to fight back with. Ukraine can return Russia behind the Iron Curtain, but we need effective weapons for that.
The BBC reported in September that the US had agreed to send new aid, this time amounting to around $2.7 billion. The BBC said the package would include howitzers, munitions, Humvee vehicles, armored ambulances, and anti-tank systems. Again, we can't tell you if this is already part of the $54 billion aid package or a bit added to it. We say a bit. $2.7 billion is hardly just a drop in the ocean of blood. It was agreed anyway without much opposition at all. As usual, the added money was greenlit by both sides of the US's political divide. This war and the attendant aid is about the only thing Democrats and Republicans can agree on for the most part. This is another reason why the aid can keep flowing. No one's against it, although not everyone feels the same about the situation. As you might know, former presidential candidate Tulsi Gabbard just left the Democrat Party. She has taken an anti-war stance and just called the Democrats an elitist cabal of warmongers. She is in a very small minority of US politicians, and if you look at her Twitter page, half the public likes to call her a traitor. The highly critical Noam Chomsky take on the US foreign policy is not exactly embraced these days by the leaders of the free world. At a sprightly 93, Chomsky's no fan of both sides of US politics in their present guises. He'd prefer real diplomacy to happen in Ukraine, which might not happen anytime soon. No one in their right mind would be a fan of Putin, so you have to wonder how this will all end. Endless war seems to be in the cards. If any entity is thrilled about this, it's the military-industrial complex, not the actual people fighting and dying. In an interview, Chomsky recently talked about the utter incompetence of the Russian military, but he issued a warning about the Western media narrative, saying, Whenever there is a virtual unanimity on complex and murky issues, something is afoot, something is missing. Another former war correspondent and journalist said, We are either looking at endless war or a potential nuclear holocaust. This will likely mean that next year there will be more billions in aid, which, short of everyone shaking hands and making some deals, is the best outcome. The other outcome is the end of the world as we know it. Millions upon millions dead. How do we ever get to this? Again, that's a long, difficult story that's more complicated than some narratives suggest. This is a show about aid, but what does aid mean? It means death and destruction, so fittingly, we'll leave you with a sobering reflection from Chomsky. Unless the great powers find ways to accommodate and confront the most important threats that have arisen in human history, environmental destruction, and nuclear war, nothing else will matter, and time is short. The Russian leader Vladimir Putin is tossing and turning in his bed. Today, he's dreaming about US-made M1A2 Abrams tanks churning up the ground, Russian soldiers screaming as they're mangled under the tracks. All these tanks are heading in the direction of the Russia-Ukraine border. Mr. Putin's dream, or shall we say nightmare, might become a reality soon as some of the best tanks in the world are being sent to Ukraine. And somewhere embossed in their frames are the words, made in the USA. This game just changed significantly. Right around the time we started making the show, U.S. news reports stated that Putin launched a series of missile and drone attacks against Ukraine in retaliation for Joe Biden announcing that U.S. tanks will indeed be on Ukraine soil at some point. Putin might well have been infuriated, which, according to the press, is why his forces blasted the capital Kyiv and yet again caused mayhem when Ukraine's energy infrastructure was hit. Putin said Ukraine and the West are escalating things again, especially after Germany also announced it would be sending some of its own tanks to Ukraine. Hardly a long trip. Russian officials seem to feel vindicated, saying all along this conflict has been a proxy war between Russia and a U.S. NATO alliance. The deputy chairman of the Security Council and former Russian president Dmitry Medvedev shared stern words after the U.S. tank news, saying the defeat of a nuclear power in a conventional war can trigger a nuclear war. Putin knows that the U.S.'s formidable M1 Abrams and Germany's Leopard 2s are a threat to the Russian war effort. But the tanks themselves might not be the reason Putin is scared. Perhaps the change in the way the West is thinking about this war is the reason for his nightmares. We'll explore both options in this show, so let's just establish some facts first. The West has just upped the ante, according to Russia. As the saying goes, them's fighting words. Russia's ambassador to Germany, Sergei Nakhayev, just said as much when he contended that sending modern Western tanks to Ukraine from Germany is extremely dangerous and poses a new level of confrontation. Putin, of course, is well aware that until now, Ukraine has been relying on tanks from another era, many of them T-72s that were used back in the days of the Soviet Union. Ukraine has said time and again that this is not good enough, not if the West is serious about helping it out. It needs modern tanks, not relics, to defeat and push back their invaders. Ukraine said it would like 100 of these high-tech tanks, but perhaps it's wishful thinking, as you'll soon understand. It's not as if anyone can just use such powerful hardware as soon as it arrives. Modern tanks are complicated. It's not like riding a bike. Ukrainian soldiers will need to be trained, especially where U.S. tanks are concerned. Germany said it would send over 14 Leopard 2s, 
tanks that quite often make it onto lists of the world's best, or at least the latest variations of them. Tank enthusiasts, yes, they do exist, might disagree about which tanks are more superior, but there can be no doubt that Germany's Leopard 2s are up there. They're nimble, reaching speeds of around 44 miles per hour, and they have a cruising range of about 280 miles. We won't go much into its firepower and the armor of these tanks. It's mostly irrelevant as both the Leopards and the Abrams far outclass any tanks Russia can field at the moment. There are about 2,000 German-made Leopard 2s in various European countries right now. Although it's not certain how many of those are battle-ready, Germany has said it hopes that the countries that bought the tank might follow its lead and send their Leopard 2s over to Ukraine. Spain and the Netherlands have already said they might do just that. When we started making the show, the Netherlands had said, the decision has not yet been made. We'll explain soon what this indecision is all about. While Russia has its excellent late-iteration T-90s and the beast of the T-14 Armada, arguably in the top three tanks in the world if Russian claims are true, in terms of mobility, firepower, armor, and, importantly, high-tech systems, it would be hard to beat the US's M1A2 Abrams. Biden said he'd send over 31 of them, which is an entire tank battalion worth in the region of $400 million. Just a drop in the ocean so far in terms of this war and what the US has been sending over to Ukraine. 31 might not sound like a lot when you consider Ukraine has already about 1,890 tanks, but of those, only 1,323 are reported to be battle-ready. And as we said, we're talking about tanks that have seen action last around the time Neil Armstrong first stepped foot on the moon. Just recently, Ukrainian soldiers fighting in an armored unit close to Bakhmut complained that they were using tanks that should have been retired before most of the commanders were born. Their T-72s are constantly breaking down, and much of the time they're visiting scrap heaps to look for new parts, or ripping up captured Russian tanks to make Frankenstein machines. Tankensteins. As you know from our other shows, Russia has lost a ton of tanks. Its tank crews have also had to make do with stuff from the 70s, sometimes engaging in making homemade armor because the armor they should have had was just not there. Russia had planned to build 2,300 of its next-generation Armada T-14s, but it seems there were issues with production over the past few years. To date, only a handful have been built. According to Kremlin-backed news services, in Russia, speaking in December 2022, the T-14s Russia does have were recently deployed to Ukraine. In terms of a face-off, the old-school T-72s are no match at all for these T-14s. They are totally different beasts. Luckily, Russia's claims are probably not true. And if they are, there's likely less than a dozen of the tanks in the country. Everything is more advanced than the T-14s. Mobility, protection, communications, firepower, with the T-14s being fitted with sensors and other tech that wasn't even dreamed about in the 70s or the 80s. Given massively improved situational awareness, armor, alleged stealth capabilities, and the pinpoint accuracy of its anti-tank missiles and main cannon, yeah, the T-72 and the T-14 are different machines altogether. That's if you take Russia's word for it, of course. A Ukrainian deputy commander recently said the Ukrainian army is in desperate need of Western tanks now, not tomorrow. He told the press, The Leopard is what we need right now. The high-precision sights and the night vision work in any weather. He added that another reason is simply the Russians are afraid of the Leopard. They have good reason to be. This doesn't mean they're any better than the Abrams. They're not, but the Ukrainians are confident that they can repair and supply the German tanks. Because, let's remember, these are European tanks and parts are always close by. One of the Ukrainian army mechanics said he could deal with the Leopards, no sweat. Telling the media, the main thing is that I know how to get everything running again. You should also know that the engines are not the same as the Abrams. That's why the US at first said it wouldn't send them. They're just too hard to maintain and repair. Others have rightly pointed out that the logistical support infrastructure for the tanks will have to be established in Ukraine before any modern tanks roll to the battlefield. This will not be easy, and that's an understatement. The Leopard 2 first arrived in service in 1979, but there have been a lot of upgrades over the years. It doesn't have very different weapon systems from the Abrams, but the tech in the Abrams is considerably different, and the armor systems are also quite different. What Ukraine is saying is, send over the Leopards now, and we can use them, and we'll wait for the Abrams in the meantime. As we said before, using tanks is not like riding a bike especially when it comes to modern tanks. So, even when those American tanks get there, Ukrainian crews will have to know what they're doing. Not everyone's confident this will be a walk in the park. The good news, according to some analysts, is that the Leopard 2 is much easier to master than many of the world's most advanced tanks. This means that Ukrainian soldiers won't have to make the harsh jump from Cold War-era tech 
straight into the advanced features of the Abrams, the Leopard 2 will act as a stepping stone. A former U.S. National Security Advisor said once those Ukrainians can use the Abrams, Russia is in big trouble. He told the media if the crew knows what it's doing, it's well-trained, does the preps, the fire checks, maintains the tank well, you just can't miss. And everything you hit is catastrophically destroyed. You only need to look at the Iraq War and see the damage the American Abrams, the German Leopards, and the British Challengers did. They can make a huge difference in Ukraine. In Iraq, an FV-4034 Challenger achieved a kill at more than 3.17 miles. At the time, it was the farthest known tank versus tank kill in history. This is the stuff of nightmares for Putin. If indeed these tanks will perform like that. Iraqi tank crews and T-72s were constantly outmaneuvered and outgunned by the British and American tanks. In any case, the trip to Europe and the training that has to happen will likely mean that the Abrams aren't put into use for several more months from now, while the Leopards should be getting mud stuck in their tracks a lot sooner, which is why Ukraine is talking about them so much. Some U.S. officials have also pointed out that the Leopards make much more sense. But it seems the U.S. is sending those Abrams whatever the naysayers say. Fighting has been hard for Ukraine lately and it doesn't look like it'll be much more progress if they don't get these tanks. Russian troops have dug in this winter, and Ukrainian counteroffensives will not by any means be easy without a lot of extra firepower. Ukraine is saying that in the coming weeks and months, it's expecting what one official called a Russian onslaught. This might just happen when Ukraine is very vulnerable. This is why Zelensky has been so vocal about wanting tanks. Alongside Germany, as we said, the Netherlands and Spain will likely get involved and the British have already agreed to send over 14 of the much-vaunted tanks we've mentioned, the Challenger 2s. This agreement didn't happen without a fight. The UK had first said it wasn't going to send over any main battle tanks, but it changed its mind in January, actually before the US and Germany made their decisions. The new British Prime Minister said the move happened in line with the country's recent ambition to intensify support. In fact, when the UK told Ukraine about its new package and Germany didn't immediately follow, Ukrainian Deputy Foreign Minister Andrei Melnyk said it was a huge disappointment for all Ukrainians. It's not difficult to understand why Germany was hesitant, given its history. If you're wondering why other countries have been hesitant to send battle tanks to Ukraine, and why some are still holding back, it's mostly because they've been hoping this war would be settled already. As we told you earlier, these are offensive weapons, and many countries have been supporting Ukraine mostly in a defensive capacity. No one wants this war to spread through Europe and possibly become another world war. A Kremlin spokesperson issued a warning in January, saying this is exactly what would happen. He said these battle tanks will bring more suffering and more tension to the continent. He added that when U.S. tanks do get to Ukraine, they will burn down just like all the others and nothing much will change. He would say that, though. He wants European taxpayers to think their money's being wasted. The question is, is it? One thing everyone on Ukraine's side is saying is that escalation is the last thing they want. The UK said the new tank package is only for Ukraine's defensive firepower, which it hopes will bring about a lasting peace. Still, it's not as if he would have said anything else. He's a politician, and politicians often say not what's true, but what they think the public should hear. Does he really think more tanks will bring peace? Listen on and make your mind up after we tell you a few more things. The UK says all Russia has to do is get out of Ukraine, and that'll be that. Joe Biden said the same. He told the media, There's no offensive threat to Russia. If Russian troops return to Russia, where they belong, this war would be over today. This obviously isn't an option for Russia, and Putin's endless threats about escalation are no longer being taken seriously by the West. Russia has already escalated this war as far as it could go, and going nuclear would ensure defeat. Not only for Russia, but perhaps the entire world. Fears of Russia attacking the rest of Europe for their support of Ukraine are flat-out silly, when you consider how badly it's losing against Ukraine. Russia can only afford so many losing wars at once. This is what ultimately scares Putin. Even if he could take out all the Western tanks being sent to Ukraine right now, there's nothing stopping Germany or the US from sending more. His threats aren't taken seriously anymore. Sure, Putin is having nightmares, but perhaps not just about human casualties. Perhaps he's haunted about the turning point his special operation has reached in Ukraine and how this will impact his position in power. In a long string of defeats, Ukraine has just delivered to Russia its most humiliating one to date. Kherson is officially liberated. But Russia retreating across the entire east could be really bad news for Ukraine. The stunning counteroffensive that began in September was initially believed to be only a flash in the pan for Ukraine. After a long string of slow but gradual defeats, 
It was inconceivable that Ukraine had the ability to so thoroughly beat Russian troops on the battlefield, and that might have been the case if not for two things, Western aid and good old-fashioned Ukrainian grit. The counteroffensive that would change the course of the war had its roots in the start of the summer when Ukraine began thinking of delivering a counterpunch to overstretched Russian lines. With an initial invasion force of just under 200,000 troops, it was clear from the start of the war that Russia's military was poorly equipped to occupy even just the east of the country. Once it became obvious that Russia would not win the swift victory it had planned for, Western analysts began to look hard at the numbers, and even with support from the separatist regions, everyone came to the same conclusion. Russia didn't have the numbers to take the entire country. It might not even have the numbers to take and hold the east. At the start of the war, Ukraine had just under 250,000 troops along with a whopping 2 million reservists, many of whom had combat experience from fighting the rebels in the breakaway regions. Russia was relying on the perceived superiority of its military technology and equipment to win a quick war, but corruption, ineptitude, and very poor doctrine inevitably revealed this force multiplier to be significantly less effective than believed to be even by the West. Add in a rapid influx of manned portable anti-tank and anti-defense systems from the US and EU, and it became clear Russia had kicked the hornet's nest, and now it was time for the hornets to sting back. The initial plan drawn up by Ukraine remains classified, but what is known is that US military leadership immediately rejected the proposal and set about working with their Ukrainian counterparts to draw up a new counteroffensive plan for the coming fall. With their combined expertise, the two nations' senior military staff drew up a plan that would capitalize on both Ukraine's strengths and Russia's weaknesses. High Mars would be the star of the show, with Ukraine making use of a long-range high-precision weapon system to destroy supply lines and command posts, making it difficult for Russia to maintain command and control centers close to the front lines, while also resupplying their troops. A clever deception campaign convinced the Russians that the Ukrainians would attack Kherson directly, thus prompting them to move several battalion tactical groups from the north of the captured territories to the south. An attack toward Kherson would signal the start of the counteroffensive, but within days, it became clear that Russia had been bamboozled, as a swift and overwhelming thrust north overwhelmed Russian positions there. Scrambling to hold the line in the north, Russia found itself unable to both defend the much more strategically important Kherson region and its lines of communication running south out of Russia into the northeast of Ukraine. The Russian Ministry of Defense and Russian military bloggers online all claimed that Ukraine simply took advantage of weakened Russian positions, and that's why they achieved so much success in the north. However, that myth was finally put to rest on November 11th when Ukrainian troops tore down the Russian flags flying in Kherson and returned the Ukrainian colors to their place. Ukraine had outfought, outmaneuvered, and outwitted a far superior Russian force, fighting on defensible terrain, forcing a panicked retreat over 48 hours from November 9th to the 10th that saw rear-guard Russian forces trying desperately to buy time for command posts to be evacuated. As we make this video, Ukraine is in control of Kherson, and this puts critical Russian bases in Crimea directly under threat from their BFF High Mars. But while this is a stunning victory, Russia's retreat could be bad news for Ukraine. First, Russia is a very sore loser. We've seen this time and again as Putin's forces are humiliated, and then he resorts to attacking defenseless civilians. This tactic of using Russia's ever-shrinking stockpile of precision weapons and drones to attack civilians and their infrastructure is, as most military analysts have put it, absolutely asinine, given that those same weapons would be better employed against the military targets Russian forces keep retreating from. But it's not just about Putin's ego being as big as his former warship now submarine the Moskva, it's also a concerted effort to try to defeat Ukraine's will to fight. If Russia can't beat the Ukrainian military, it would rather destroy the civilian population's will to continue fighting. By targeting residential blocks and shopping malls, Russia wants to terrorize the population into submission. The destruction of power plants and power distribution networks is meant to deprive the Ukrainian people of electricity right as winter approaches, when they'll need it most to heat their homes. So while Ukraine's military victories mount, Russia's willingness to commit war crimes only increases. As of the making of the show, there is yet to be a retaliatory attack by Russia, but one is sure to come. One can only guess as to the scale of the attack and the price innocent civilians will have to pay for the Russian military's ineptitude. Liberating Kherson will place pressure on additional fronts, though. To put it simply, Putin is looking for an out that will preserve his legitimacy. But to date, Russian forces have failed to secure even the breakaway regions of Luhansk and Donetsk. The only way Putin would have been able to swallow losing the regional capital of Kherson 
was if his military commanders promised him they could put those troops to use, pushing Ukrainian forces out of the separatist regions entirely for once and for all. So freedom for Kherson means increased and desperate fighting for forces and civilians in Luhansk and Donetsk. There is a significant strategic concern as well with Russia's retreat from Kherson, however. The taking of the city is a huge boon to both the morale of Ukraine's military and its ability to continue prosecuting the war. But Ukraine was unable to prevent a mass retreat by Russian forces. This means that thousands of Russian soldiers will live to fight another day, and even more importantly, they are now safely on the other side of a very difficult river crossing. Just ask the Russians how difficult river crossings can be. Russia had long been preparing for a retreat from Kherson, though, and has delivered prefabricated concrete fighting positions to the eastern riverbank. These concrete structures are blast resistant and can withstand small arms fire, while allowing private conscriptivich inside to return fire with relative safety. The fact that there is no functioning bridge that military vehicles can use to cross Dnipro River means that Ukraine will have to either attempt to build a pontoon bridge or use ferries like the Russians did. But ferries are slow and can only move limited amounts of equipment at a time, which is why the Russians were forced to leave so much of it behind. Few ferries are available or even rated to carry heavy main battle tanks. And pontoon bridges are famously risky affairs, as the enemy can easily zero in on your bridge and destroy it with air power or artillery the moment vehicles begin to cross it. If there is a saving grace in all this for Ukraine, it is the fact that the Ukrainian military is not as, uh, well, operationally challenged as the Russian military. Back in Bilohorivka, the Russians made multiple attempts to cross a river at the exact same spot, despite every single attempt being blasted to pieces by the Ukrainian artillery. Because junior officers are not allowed to make battlefield decisions on their own, Senior commander sitting happily in a rear area insisted the crossing of the Seversky Donets be repeated in the exact same area over and over again. Estimates put Russia's losses at an entire battalion tactical group's worth of men and equipment. The incident was a military disaster of such a scale that the United States trolled Russia publicly on its US Army Europe and Africa Twitter account. Ukraine has its eyes on Crimea now, and Kherson gives it a staging ground to do so. However, it must cross the Dnipro River and then defeat the heavily fortified Russian forces there. This is going to be a significant challenge even for battle-hardened Ukrainian forces. And while the liberation of Kherson was a huge strategic victory, until the Dnipro can be bridged successfully, Ukraine faces a steep uphill battle to win the war from here. But Ukrainian grit combined with Western weapons and advisors have proven to be a force to truly be reckoned with. Russia continues to bombard Ukraine, inflicting heavy losses on its neighbor cities and population. But is Russia actually on the losing side of the war? As Putin gets more and more unstable, Russian losses are piling up in more ways than one. On September 7th, a little over six months after the war began, Vladimir Putin spoke at an economic forum in Russia and made a bizarre statement. He claimed that Russia hadn't lost anything in the war in Ukraine, something anyone could see was false. While Russia has a far larger country and army than its neighbor, it has suffered far higher casualties. While Russia really isn't in the business of providing accurate casualty numbers, outside observers and Ukrainian officials estimate they might have lost as many as 40,000 soldiers in total, many of them high-ranking officers. But the losses go far deeper than that. By the end of August, it was estimated that Russia lost more than $16 billion in military equipment, tanks, planes, and ships, all being sent up in flames by the Ukrainian military, backed up by the strength of NATO weapons. Most of these were older weapons, some dating back to the Cold War, but Russia has suffered bigger losses as well. Most famously, the missile cruiser Moskva. The massive ship was one of Russia's crown jewels, worth around $750 million, and it was sent to the bottom of the Black Sea back in April. And those losses just keep piling up. And you know who else is likely losing money each month? Here's a hint. It's not another country, it's you! That's right, you are, and you probably don't even realize it. But don't worry, I was in your position not long ago and changed all that thanks to the sponsor of today's video, Rocket Money. Rocket Money is an all-in-one finance platform that helps you save more and spend less. It's like your own personal finance manager, where you can find and cancel subscriptions you don't use, lower your bills, track your spending, and even build your savings all in one place. It was that last one where Rocket Money really helped me out. Through their platform, I was able to identify multiple subscriptions I was completely unaware of that were charging me each month. But what I loved most was how easy Rocket Money made it to cancel those subscriptions. I didn't even have to chat with customer service reps or go through long hold times. Rocket Money took care of the cancellation for me, 
saving me money and time. And they've helped me with so much more than just expenses, too. With Rocket Money, you can set budgets that will monitor your spending in certain categories, such as dining out or entertainment, and send you notifications when you've exceeded them. And they help you track your net worth, too. Just link your investment accounts to the app and they'll help you monitor the value of your equity, debts, and assets over time, including your collectible items. If you're looking to take control of your finances, what are you waiting for? Try Rocket Money yourself right now by going to rocketmoney.com slash infographics show to start managing your personal finances today. Now back to Russia and their growing losses. Even as Russia takes territory, they keep being pushed back. Cities like Lyman were taken by the Russians early in the war, only to see the Ukrainian forces push them back in late summer and early fall, driving the Russians out, resulting in many soldiers abandoning their posts. Putin declared the conquered regions as part of Russia after referendums condemned globally as shams, but it didn't change the facts on the ground. Lyman's Russian occupation fell to the Ukrainian forces the day after the annexation was announced. That meant that all the equipment, manpower, and blood put into conquering these regions was largely for nothing, and not even Russia's older gains are safe anymore. The Crimean Peninsula, a region of Ukraine that's been under Russian control for a long time and has a significant base of Russian loyalists, was conquered by Russia back in 2014 and had been seen as a foregone conclusion. After all, Russia defends its territory fiercely and no one wanted to give Putin a reason to escalate. But with Putin refusing to even promise to leave Ukraine independent or its president alive, there was no reason to hold back, and Crimea came under fire by the same liberation forces as the fall began. Is there any hope of liberating this long-time Russian-occupied area? It's likely to be much trickier than any of the other areas due to its population, but the biggest blow to the region came on October 6, 2022, when an explosion took out a large part of the bridge connecting Russia to the city of Kerch in Crimea. This was a key shipping lane and one of the biggest ways Russia kept its forces supplied as they poured into Ukraine. It caused a supply chain crisis, led to a multi-day partial shutdown, and ruined Putin's birthday, happening the day after he turned 70. This incident might have been the cause of Putin's escalation in recent days, although no one's sure who did it or how they did it. Even so, this was another costly blow to the Russian war effort. But one thing may be keeping Russian costs on the battlefield to a minimum. To put it politely, Russia runs a vintage military. To put it less politely, their army consists of poorly paid draftees working with Cold War era equipment. This explains why Ukraine and its allies are having such an easy time inflicting losses on the Russian military. But it also keeps the costs of losses to a minimum. After all, Russia built up its army heavily during the Cold War to prepare for a conflict against an equal power that never happened. So it has a massive surplus of weapons to call on and the recent partial mobilization kicked off a massive draft, meaning Putin won't be short on soldiers assuming he can keep them from deserting. And even with these mitigation factors, it's estimated Russia is spending $900 million on the war effort each day. But the battlefield losses, which have likely gone well over $20 billion by October, are only scratching the surface, because the war has left Russia's economy in absolute shambles. This is one of the only wars in recent memory where the entire world felt obligated to declare which side they were on. Most powers not only condemned Russia but imposed devastating and wide-reaching economic sanctions. Other countries like Israel, India, and even China may have tried to stay neutral at first but are increasingly backing away from Putin as he appears more isolated. Putin's only loyal allies who are supporting his war are fellow pariah states like Syria, North Korea, and neighboring Belarus. And that has taken a massive bite out of Russia's economy. Russia has seen itself largely cut off from global financial system as Western nations try to starve out the leadership. The United States barred Russia from using foreign currency to pay off debts as the ruble craters, while the UK banned major Russian banks from their financial system and even froze the assets of Russian banks and individuals. The biggest blow was probably when Russian banks were yanked off the international financial network SWIFT which made it incredibly difficult for Russia to continue selling their top export. Because in Russia, oil is king. Russian oil and gas exports are the country's top moneymaker, and the world is turning off the pipeline. The European Union took the dramatic step of cutting off Russian oil imports as of December 2022, and two months later, refined oil products will join them. Germany canceled the opening of a major new pipeline, Nord Stream 2, and the entire EU cut off Russian coal. However, the EU has not cut off imports of Russian gas since they rely on it for close to half of their energy needs. This has given Putin an opening, leveraging Russia's gas as the long cold winter looms. 
But Russia stands to lose untold billions if its energy exports are cut off, which is why Putin has become more aggressive, even potentially sabotaging a Norwegian pipeline in an incident currently under investigation. And the world is targeting Russia in many other ways. Dual-use goods, those that can be used for both civilian and military purposes like car parts, have been cut off from Russia via export ban from the UK, EU, and US. Those three powers, along with Canada, have also banned the export of luxury goods to Russia. So, no French champagne for Vladimir. Russian gold can no longer be imported, and heavy taxes have been imposed on other imports like vodka. But perhaps the biggest blow to Russia's business sector has been a ban on Russian flights to the US, UK, EU, or Canada, cutting off the ability of many powerhouse oligarchs to do business around the world. And that poses multiple problems. Because it's not just the Russian government that's being targeted, it's the most powerful businessmen from the country. Putin surrounds himself with an elite group of power brokers, usually billionaires from the energy or financial sector. They've been called oligarchs by the media, and they're among the only people in Russia besides Putin who enjoy a high standard of living. And they'd better enjoy it while it lasts, because in Putin's Russia, you're only in the inner circle until you're not. And many former oligarchs have found themselves suddenly under arrest and their assets seized by the states. So it's not a surprise many of them keep a secondary home in a freer country abroad, or at least they did. More than a thousand powerful individuals from Russia have been personally sanctioned by the West, while proposals to target all Russian citizens with sanctions have been shot down as discriminatory, especially as many are refugees who left the Putin regime while they still could. The ones being targeted are generally allies of Putin. The sanctions range from government officials being banned from entering other countries to billionaires like Roman Abramovich having their assets seized. Abramovich, the former owner of the UK football team Chelsea Football Club, found himself unable to either use his assets or sell them. And one item has become the symbol of these sanctions. One of the ultimate luxury items for billionaires is the super yacht, the closest thing anyone will come to personally owning a cruise ship. These massive symbols of wealth are perfect for when you want to head into international water to do god knows what. But they have to dock somewhere, and multiple Russian billionaires found their yachts being seized by Western governments in recent months. While many businessmen protested that they personally hadn't committed any crimes and their property is being seized without trial, the general response from the government so far has been, so sue us. And there's one final factor that's going to cost Russia a lot of money. Ever since the Soviet Union fell, Russia tried to recast itself as a haven for industry. Under past President Boris Yeltsin, they largely succeeded, and this gave rise to the oligarch era. But under Putin's more militaristic regime, things have changed. Businessmen had to worry about being arrested or their assets being seized. Foreign citizens have been arrested on trumped-up charges, most famously the WNBA star Brittany Griner, who was playing in a basketball league in Russia shortly before the war when she was arrested on marijuana charges and sent to a labor camp after being convicted. So, it's no surprise that many companies are thinking twice about doing business there. In the aftermath of the war, countless companies have pulled out. Some, like McDonald's, did it out of outrage at Russia's aggression. Others, like Netflix, found the new policies in Russia to be impossible to work with. Netflix was reportedly ordered to place multiple channels of Russian government news propaganda on the surface and chose to withdraw from Russia in light of those requests. Which means Russian soldiers deployed to Ukraine may be more interested in finding a place where they can watch the next season of Stranger Things. They might as well make themselves comfortable and try to keep their head down as losses will only keep mounting until the war ends. So, how much has Russia actually lost from the war? We cannot give you an exact dollar amount as most of the economic losses are internal and likely underreported. The figure is near incalculable because of how many elements got into it. We know they've lost billions in military equipment, and their current mobilization effort is likely to cost billions as well, even with them cutting every corner possible on equipment and training. They've also lost billions in Russian oil exports, and those losses are likely to escalate massively in the winter. Putin's hoping that Europe breaks and stops supporting Ukraine due to a cold winter. But if you're betting on Mother Nature bailing you out, it's not a good sign. And the US alone has seized as much as $30 billion from Russian oligarchs. So the odds are that before the situation in Ukraine is resolved, the war losses from Russia will mount to the trillions and maybe only getting worse, because the sanctions are likely to continue for the duration of the war, and Western powers may tighten the screws on Putin further. If the war ends via defeat for Russia or a negotiated withdrawal, the odds are heavy reparations will be imposed on Russia for the rebuilding of Ukraine, which has suffered billions in losses of its own. So Russia's choice may be to either suffer under sanctions or take a bigger upfront financial hit to get out of the war, which might be why Putin is looking at a third option, 
keep escalating, threaten the West, and hope everyone gets scared enough to let him have his way. When the Russian government announced to the world that they were withdrawing from Kherson, no one took them seriously. Everyone thought it was an attempt at a disinformation campaign. After all, the Ukrainians had done the same thing just a few months before when they announced their Kherson initiative, but struck north by Kharkiv with the bulk of their army. While optimistic, Ukrainian leaders and the world figured that Russia was still digging in for a long fight, but to everyone's surprise, they actually left. But why would withdrawing from Kherson benefit Russia? Before understanding how it would benefit Russia, it's essential to understand just how big of a deal Kherson was to the Russians. Before the war, Kherson was home to several hundred thousand people and was the only regional capital to fall to the invaders. Being the biggest city under Russian occupation, Kherson served as a symbol of the new administration. The Russian army had decided to make Kherson into a fortress. Over the past several months, Putin and his generals moved the bulk of his forces to Kherson. Reliable estimates placed the number of troops in the Kherson Oblast at 40,000, while the attacking Ukrainian army could muster just 23,000 soldiers. These 40,000 troops also included some of the best remaining units left in the Russian army, like the remaining paratroopers and the air assault brigades. Russian paratroopers had been defending Kherson for the past several months, but slowly and surely Ukrainian forces made their way closer to the city. By the time Russia had announced its withdrawal, Ukraine had surrounded the city on three sides and was about 10 kilometers from the city center. With the battle practically inevitable, Russian forces had been forcibly depopulating Kherson over the past several months. Tens of thousands of civilians were forced to cross the Dnipro River into Russian captivity. Some children were even forced to relocate to Russia, and Ukrainian men were enlisted into the Russian army at gunpoint. Replacing these civilians were thousands more troops, including tons of recently drafted Russian men who were instantly thrown to battle. All these military preparations and statements Putin made, like Kherson is Russia forever, show just how important the city was to Russia. Abandoning it was no easy choice for Putin, but why he did so was one of the few times Putin favored a military objective over a political one. Crossing rivers is one of the most dangerous things an army can do. Often troops get bunched up on one side as weight restrictions limit the number of people and vehicles crossing at one time. These large concentrations of troops are vulnerable to artillery, rocket, and airstrikes. The Dnipro River is the main physical feature of the area, and it is a massive river that flows from southwestern Ukraine into the heart of the country. Any fight over Kherson would involve having to get troops and material across that river reliably. As previous operations have shown, Russia is notoriously bad at river crossing operations. Back in May, near Kharkiv, Russia repeatedly tried to force a river crossing of the Seversky Donetsk River. Here, Russian forces were trying to outflank Ukrainian defenders around Kharkiv. Crossing the river meant that they could encircle and bypass strong defensive positions on the southern flank of Kharkiv. However, Ukrainian drone strikes and merciless artillery barrages stopped the operation in its tracks. For weeks, Russian forces tried to cross the river with no success. Ukraine kept destroying each pontoon bridge Russian engineers built, and Ukrainian forces decimated troop formations waiting to cross. Because of this painful memory, it was clear to Russian commanders that crossing rivers under fire was not something their army could do well. As Ukrainian troops inched closer to the city center, they could move their artillery and rocket batteries into better firing positions on Kherson and its river crossings. Among these weapons is the infamous American HIMARS system. With the capability to fire a rocket up to 45 miles away, the HIMARS system is deadly accurate and powerful. The Russians in Kherson clearly feared its devastating fire. In the months leading up to the Russian retreat, satellite images revealed that the Kherson International Airport was still a bustling base. Helicopters, tanks, and armored vehicles filled the runway. However, as Ukrainian forces made their way closer to the city, Russia pulled its equipment, moving it further away from the airport and closer to the Dnipro River or across it. Russia attempted to use the infamous Antonivsky Bridge to resupply its forces. The Antonivsky Bridge is the main artery that connects Kherson to the other side of the Dnipro River. Though out of range of Ukrainian strikes before, Ukrainian artillery forces used the deadly accurate HIMARS to make the bridge unusable. While the HIMARS rockets are not strong enough to take down a bridge of that size, they were able to blow up the roads on the bridge because of how accurate it was. After HIMARS destroyed the roads over the bridge, Russian troops decided to use another supply route further north. Spanning across Kakhova Dam, this was Russia's second attempt at resupplying forces by land. However, HIMARS strikes once again blew up the road. It's important to note here that the strikes only destroyed the road on top of the dam, not the dam itself, as Russian media reported. With the two major river crossings knocked out, Russian engineers tried to build a pontoon bridge to ferry troops and equipment across. Ukrainian forces put this crossing under a murderous barrage of artillery and rocket fire day and night. After knocking out the pontoon bridge, the Russians gave up trying to build a major supply route across the Dnipro River. 
But even if Russia could resupply its troops, they faced another enemy, the weather. Ukraine gets notoriously cold, with temperatures often dropping into the single digits or below freezing. Combined with snow and wind chill, Ukraine becomes a soldier's worst enemy in the winter. Because Russia has constantly been attacking the nation's infrastructure, few houses here likely had running water, gas, or electricity. Trying to motivate soldiers to fight in the dark, cold homes on city blocks where they could not see anything is something Russian generals thought was too much to ask. Another motivation factor was that the troops in Kherson were demoralized and defeated mentally. Most units bottled up in Kherson had never been in constant combat for nine months. After Putin started mobilizing reservists, the first troops brought into service went straight to Kherson. But it was not only high casualties that broke down unit cohesion that was concerning for Russian forces, it was Ukrainian partisans. Kherson is noted to have one of the most active partisan movements in all the occupied regions of Ukraine. Ukrainian citizens quickly made their dislike of Russian occupation known early on in the war. They openly defied Russian troops within days when they assembled in the city center and carried Ukrainian flags. Since then, the resistance movement has grown. Partisans in Kherson regularly carried out attacks, and no one was safe. Ukrainian collaborators and Russian service members were targeted with near impunity. Partisans conducted a series of car bombings throughout the summer and early fall against pro-Russian officials. They also assassinated others with mobile hit squads. Partisans also ran their own psychological warfare campaign by constantly putting up anti-Russian flyers that threatened death to Russian soldiers and rewards for destroying Russian equipment. Partisan farmers also resisted the Russian administration by refusing to harvest wheat. Because wheat is one of the country's main cash crops, the locals in Kherson did not want to feed or aid the Russian war machine in any way. But Kherson partisans not only conducted covert hits on Russian collaborators, they directly aided the Ukrainian military. As the regular army got closer to Kherson, partisans were quite active in helping identify targets for the Ukrainian artillery and airstrikes. In one famous example, partisans gave the army the coordinates of a Russian base. Soon afterward, a Ukrainian artillery barrage leveled it, killing up to 200 soldiers and two high-ranking officers. The partisan problem in Kherson was so bad that Russia admitted it in a rare public admission. The Russian government had to divert troops away from the front line to carry out counter-insurgent operations. Federal police officers from the St. Petersburg area and Spetsnaz operatives were also brought in to quash the partisans. All these efforts failed. Even as late as five days before the Russian withdrawal, Ukrainian collaborators were still dying under mysterious circumstances. On November 6, the deputy head of Kherson Oblast died in a car accident. However, many suspect he fell victim to yet another partisan car bombing. Even with all of Russia's best efforts at keeping the partisan problem under wraps, it clearly had no hope of keeping the situation under control. Pulling out of Kherson rid them with having to deal with fighting a regular army and an insurgent army who showed no signs of stopping. Pulling out of Kherson also had operational benefits. It seems that Russia is shifting back to the east and south for its own major offensive. Over the past several weeks, Russian forces have launched a ferocious counterattack against Bakhmut. The town of Bakhmut lies in the middle of a major crossroads, and taking control of that city denies Russia the use of highways for faster troop movement and resupply. In the Zaporizhia region, Russian forces have recently launched a series of minor offensives that have made some gains. However, outside observers have noted that despite the massive disparity in numbers, the Russians are making dumb tactical errors. For example, they're not allowing newly mobilized troops to acclimate or train. Instead, these soldiers are thrown directly into combat. Why seasoned military officers would do such things in recent weeks only makes sense politically. After Russia's new supreme Ukraine commander took over, he was very adamant that Kherson be abandoned. However, as we stated earlier, evacuating Kherson was a huge political pill for Putin to swallow. Western and Ukrainian intelligence believed that Putin only allowed Russian commanders to pull out of Kherson with the promise of a renewed offensive in the east and south. With this understanding, the haphazard attacks in those areas make sense because these same commanders wanted to show Putin they were making a good faith effort for that promise. Because of this, Russian generals will likely try to quickly transfer the tens of thousands of troops evacuated east to the new front. Though many people have speculated that Putin did this as a good faith measure toward negotiations, this is unlikely. For their part, Ukraine has explicitly said it will continue its offensive. Stopping now would only benefit Russia. Putin and his cronies understand the Ukrainian position and know that a ceasefire is now even less likely than before. Instead, Putin might have wanted the evacuation from Kherson as a reason for general mobilization. Western observers noted that for the longest time, Putin wanted to mobilize his country to fight the war when it was clear that Ukraine would not lay over and submit to Russia. However, his cronies advised against this, since they still wanted to keep up the facade that the special military operation was a limited war. 
It was not until Ukraine's lightning blitz in the northeast that Putin was forced to mobilize 300,000 Russians to shore up its lines. Hardliners in the Russian media and political circles are already calling for general mobilization. Putin likely still desires this route since it will best guarantee his victory. Though he may not do it right away, pulling out of Kherson gives him the justification needed to bring the rest of the country into this war. On October 8, 2022, the bridge built by Russia connecting it with Crimea underwent a mysterious and sudden deconstruction event. The world was quick to give credit for the explosion to Ukraine, but the nation hasn't actually come forward yet to claim responsibility. It's almost certain that the attack on the Kerch Bridge was the work of Ukraine, but the question is how? Using aircraft is out of the question given that the entire area is very well protected by S-400 and S-300 air defense units. American stealth aircraft could likely evade these defenses to get close enough to launch standoff munitions, but Ukraine simply lacks the capabilities. Missile attack is also extremely unlikely as to date the United States has refused to give Ukraine the long-range attack weapons it's been asking for for months. The distance from Ukrainian-held territory to the Kerch Bridge is also considerable, over 120 miles. This does put the bridge in Inside the range of the U.S. Army Tactical Combat Missile System, or ATACMS, but this is the exact weapon that the U.S. has so far withheld for fear of Ukraine using it to strike inside Russia and escalate the war. But it isn't impossible this is the weapon responsible, given that right before the attack on the bridge, Ukraine had offered to give the U.S. complete oversight of all targets it used long-range weapons on. There's a possibility that the bridge was mined by Ukrainian special forces who have shown incredible skill and creativity throughout the conflict. However, the currents under the bridge are treacherous and the waters near it patrolled by the Russian Navy. It would then require operators to make a significant climb up to the floor of the bridge itself to plant the explosives. Not impossible, just extremely improbable. What's likely is that the Kerch bridge attack was undertaken with the use of a truck bomb, though details are extremely scarce. Was the driver of the truck aware of his payload, or did Ukraine use a suicide bomber to carry out the attack? Suicide attacks have not been a feature of the Ukrainian playbook so this is unlikely, which means that the payload of the truck was unknown to the driver. The attack managed to kill three people, damage one of the rail lines, and destroy one segment used by cars. It has crippled motor vehicle traffic in and out of the area, and put a serious hamper on the use of the motorway to move supplies and troops into Crimea. But if the goal of the attack was to shut down Russia's capability to use it for resupply, then the attack failed. Within days, the all-important railways were once more operational. Russia famously uses rail to resupply its troops, a serious deficiency because it lacks the truck transport capability to then move those supplies from safe railheads to the front lines. The further away the front is, the slower Russia can move supplies as it requires its limited truck pool to drive further for longer. But the attack has left Russia shaken to its core, as evidenced by the fact that in retaliation to the attack, Putin ordered a barrage of missiles against mostly civilian targets in Ukraine. Kyiv was hit especially hard with multiple civilians killed, as missiles landed on a pedestrian bridge, or near it, as Russian precision weapons have never really been precise, and a public park. The attack was almost a knee-jerk reaction to once more being humiliated by Ukraine in a place that Ukrainian forces were supposed to be incapable of reaching. Even more than that, though, it's not just a war crime but also foolish as Russia expends what remaining precision weapons it has, attacking civilians instead of the military targets, better even now defeating it on the battlefield. While the attack on the Kerch Bridge might have been a tactical failure, it had a significant strategic value. For starters, it once more puts Russia on the back foot. The Kerch Bridge is a critical link between Russia and occupied Crimea, through which much of the weapons, personnel, and vehicles needed for the war in Ukraine flow. Severing this vital logistical artery would cripple the ability to resupply Russian forces in Crimea and in the south of Ukraine. But just the fact that Ukraine managed to attack what is supposed to be a very secure feature far from the front shows the vulnerability of Russia to asymmetrical attacks, and defending against these types of threats is extremely resource-intensive. When the United States was waging its wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, it had to devote significant resources to countering asymmetrical threats from terrorists to guerrilla attacks on supply bases, consuming a lot of its manpower and limiting the scope of the operations it could undertake. The US is, however, far more capable than Russia and was able to successfully prosecute offensives while protecting from asymmetrical threats. A lack of capability isn't the only defense, though, as Russia must now dedicate manpower and resources to protecting areas once seen as safely out of reach of Ukraine, and manpower and resources are two things that Russia is critically in low supply of. The attack also had a significant effect on the morale of both the Russian people and its military. Every time Ukraine does the impossible, it makes Russians feel more vulnerable, 
This has had a very real psychological effect on both the population and conscripts, which are even now being thrown into combat. If Ukraine can strike such sensitive areas as the Kerch Bridge and supposedly safe air bases deep inside Crimea, then where else can it hit? And the frontline Russian conscript has to ask himself also, was this the work of saboteurs, or is Ukraine fielding advanced NATO weapons that are now being aimed directly at you? It's a hugely demoralizing turn of events, for sure. The bridge, however, has significant value as a target for one other reason. It basically immortalizes Russia's annexation of Crimea. It's an impressive feat of Russian engineering, stretching over 10 miles in length and featuring a span for both rail and road traffic. Construction began in 2015, a year after Crimea was seized by Russia, and meant to legitimize Russia's claim to the territory. At a cost of $3.7 billion, the bridge was completed in record time in 2019, officially making it the longest bridge in Europe. Putin himself was present at the ceremony opening it for traffic, signaling a new height of Russian power and prestige. And that's why the bridge has significant value for Ukraine as a propaganda target. Destroying or even just damaging the bridge is like directly attacking Putin and the legitimacy of his special military operation. But for Ukrainians, the bridge is a symbol of Russia's aggression and the great crime they perpetuated in 2014 by seizing Crimea, traditionally known as the Jewel of the Black Sea for its vast beauty. Destroying the Kerch Bridge is not just a strategic goal of Ukraine, but an act of revenge. If in the future Ukraine can manage to fully down this impressive span, it will almost certainly signal not just the collapse of Russia's supply lines into Crimea, but the very collapse of Russia's war efforts in Ukraine. The news coming out of Ukraine is not good for Russia. 10,741 visually confirmed losses of pieces of heavy equipment, 2,054 of which are tanks either destroyed, abandoned, or captured. Estimates without visual confirmation place it around 3,000. Over half of its KA-52 attack helicopter fleet destroyed, with five in one week during the June Ukrainian counteroffensive alone. Documents revealed by the infamous Discord leak show that the Department of Defense estimates Russia has suffered between 189,500 to 223,000 casualties, with between 35,500 to 43,000 killed in action. And that was before the Ukrainian counteroffensive began, with fierce fighting across the northern front. Alleged HIMARS strikes were especially devastating, with one strike in mid-June that allegedly killed dozens of Russian soldiers waiting to hear their commander speak. That information has yet to be verified, however. As its offensive began, Ukraine enacted a media blackout across its front, ceding the propaganda war to Russia for several weeks. However, when the lights came back on to the world, they saw a steady stream of Russian POWs being marched away from the front. The Russian lines aren't crumbling, but they are breaking. And Ukraine is yet to put the full might of its reserve Western-trained firepower into the fight. So, why can't Russia field better troops and equipment? Better is a relative term when Russia is concerned, especially when talking about its troops. Historically, Russian troops have severely underperformed against any international grading system. While in exercises like its famous Zaypad combined arms exercise, Russia got to LARP as a professional Western military. The truth is that when put to the test, Russian soldiers fail. In the First Chechen War, the massive Russian army was roundly defeated by Chechen rebels. Russia's initial force of 23,800 faced off against an estimated 1,000-strong rebel army, increasing to 6,000 after a year of fighting. Despite this, Russia suffered a whopping 14,000 killed or missing and 52,000 wounded. Estimates on the Chechen side place military losses at 3,000 dead. Even Russia's elite paratroopers, worshipped as demigods in Russian society, thoroughly embarrassed themselves such is the infamous case when a 50-strong assault force landed behind enemy lines and was promptly taken captive, forcing the Russian military to fly helicopters overhead, blasting out a warning that if they weren't released, the Russian Air Force would destroy several villages nearby. The Second Chechen War wouldn't go much better, though Russia managed to subdue the region by backing pro-Russian Chechen warlords. In both cases, however, Russian military failures were so significant that they were forced to rely on brute force alone to subdue the region. In the now infamous bombings of Grozny and other Chechen cities, the Russian military leveraged the only real advantage it had, superior firepower. Through an extensive bombing and artillery campaign, Chechnya was reduced to rubble, with civilian casualties estimated to be as high as 100,000. When your troops are hot garbage, it helps if you have the world's largest artillery corps. The real question is, why are Russian troops so bad, and can they get any better? Russia's woes has always go back to its extreme corruption. Since the fall of the Soviet Union, Russia has struggled to field a Western-style professional military and has relied overwhelmingly on conscription, 
Before the Ukraine conflict, it had made significant strides toward that goal, with an estimated three-quarters of its armed forces being professional volunteer soldiers. The service length for conscripts was also dropped from 24 months to 12 months, which after training and orientation only gave Russia about five months of use from each batch of conscripts. However, tellingly, conscripts still made up a third of Russia's combat armed forces, including its elite Spetsnaz units, something which is unthinkable in the US military. The difference between conscripts and volunteers is significant, with volunteer soldiers having greater morale and proficiency than conscripts. Typically, a volunteer soldier chooses to serve and is more motivated to do so than a conscript forced to serve. However, volunteer soldiers are also serving for longer terms, allowing their military to get more combat-ready time out of them in relation to the length of their training, and to build a greater degree of proficiency and thus lethality over time. Professional volunteers also form the backbone of the military itself, moving up the ranks and increasing in knowledge and expertise, making them and their organization more efficient. Once a conscript's term is up, they are offered service contracts, but the vast majority choose to immediately leave, taking their talent, millions of rubles in training costs, and expertise with them. And speaking of backbones, Russia's military has none. Not just in that it's a cowardly army incapable of standing up to a peer adversary and forced to try to bomb civilians instead, but as it lacks the basic building block of a professional Western-style military. Volunteers who re-enlist advance in rank, making up the non-commissioned officer corps that's so integral to the success of a modern military. These are the senior enlisted men whose jobs it is to oversee the day-to-day -day operation of the military, everything from enforcing training standards to direct battlefield leadership. Instead of an NCO corps, Russia just makes junior and warrant officers take up those roles, much to its detriment. These are typically men and women who have had higher academic training and are thus more valuable and more rare, and better suited for the challenges of higher leadership positions than watching over a squad of conscripts. This forces Russia to overwork its officers, placing significant stresses on them and inevitably leading to the deferment of authority and leadership to senior conscripts or low-ranking recruits. And this is not a modern problem either. As noted during the Cold War, Soviet units were typically run by second-year conscripts, with what few NCOs the Soviet Union did have deferring to them in most matters. For any of our viewers who have ever served in the military, you can well imagine what a nightmare scenario it would be to have E2s and E3s in charge of running day-to-day -day operations. You can probably also imagine just how well those operations were managed, let alone actual battlefield actions. NCOs are responsible for making sure that orders from the top are followed through, and we have plenty of evidence from the Ukrainian conflict that this is not always being followed through or done so poorly thanks to the lack of a solid leadership structure amongst Russian units. However, Russia's lack of NCOs also directly contributes to its biggest problem in attracting and keeping talented recruits, hazing. It's called the Rule of the Grandfathers, and it's a nightmare of hazing that would make any college frat initiation ritual look like a pleasant walk in the park. The secret to Russian military hazing is that it never stops. It just perpetually flows downhill, even from the highest echelons of military power. Older conscripts brutalize those younger than them, with what few NCOs exist brutalizing the senior conscripts, while officers do the same to their NCOs. Beatings, humiliation, torture, even forced labor and sexual assault. There are a wide range of reports from Russian leaders simply renting their troops to local villages to use for hard labor. Meanwhile, older recruits and conscripts commit outright sexual assault on younger conscripts and force them to beg their families for money so they can steal it. Officers, meanwhile, look the other way, mostly because they're engaged in different forms of hazing themselves, albeit at a more subtle level. Hazing is nothing new in the Russian armed forces. It's a pass-me-down from the Soviet times. Hazing, however, is pure poison to a military, as it destroys unit cohesiveness and retention. In his memoir, Kirill Podrabinik wrote in 1970 that if his unit was thrust into combat, half of the unit might shoot the other half. There have been no documented cases of this happening, but there are plenty of cases of murder spurred on by hazing in the Russian armed forces. But where it really hurts a military is in the ability to retain talent even with significant incentives. Only 1% of Soviet conscripts re-enlisted with the army, and that figure has not improved much. Especially because after the fall of the Soviet Union, the situation got even worse. Political officers were removed from military units, taking away one major source of discipline in the Red Army. The entire military received a significant reduction in pay, prompting junior officers to steal equipment or from their own troops, or to be too preoccupied with a second job to pay much attention to the discipline of their unit. 
In 2002, the BBC published a report where senior Russian soldiers were selling those junior to them into prostitution rings. As the Russian economy recovered, hazing seems to have improved somewhat, but it's impossible to know given how tight-lipped Russia is. A law passed by Vladimir Putin in 2015 made military fatalities suffered in peacetime a state secret, in effect making it impossible to calculate how many conscripts or recruits were being killed or committed suicide due to hazing. A key aspect of a modern military are ready reserves. The US military fields reserves for all of its branches except the Space Force, and these reserves were of critical importance during the dual wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Good reserve systems allow a military to retain a large pool of proficient soldiers that it can call upon in case of a war, long after they've been separated from the military. With monthly training capped by a larger evolution once a year, reservists maintain proficiency in their respective career fields while living a civilian life. This allows a nation to double or more its standing forces with proficient soldiers in case of war, rather than bloat it with freshly conscripted soldiers with no training or expertise. Russia, however, lacks a modern reserve system. In 2008, the nation launched a massive reform aimed at creating a professional NCO corps and a reserve system. Both goals have failed. Instead, Russia is focused on improving its air and rocket forces, though you really wouldn't know it by looking at the performance of the Russian aerospace forces in Ukraine, which has been abysmal. Despite having nearly 1 million people with previous service time to call upon, this pool of Russian personnel only served their single one-year term and have limited military proficiency. Meanwhile, less than 10% of this potential reserve force receives any kind of refresher training. And training might be Russia's biggest problem, because it simply doesn't do much of it. Russian military culture has a tradition of what's known as picture reports, whereas a Western military would file a report on the results of training with updated goals and frequent inspections, the Russian military simply marches its troops to a firing range, has them fire off one or two shots, takes a picture, and calls it a day. The photo report serves its purpose. It establishes that on the required day, said unit was in fact at the range shooting their allotment of ammunition to maintain proficiency. In reality, officers simply take the budget given to them for training and split it amongst themselves. The same goes for soldiers' actual pay. A Russian unit commander is responsible for receiving and disseminating his soldiers' pay. Naturally, said commander skims a percentage off the top for himself first. The system also incentivizes commanders to overstate their unit numbers. Despite not being at full strength, a commander will report all billets filed so he can receive pay allotted to soldiers who don't exist. Meanwhile, when senior Russian officers make battlefield decisions on what units to deploy where, they do so not realizing that those units may be significantly under strength. This culture is not an accident, however, rather it's part of the social contract that Russia's culture of corruption has established with all branches of its government and military. You're free to be corrupt as long as you largely do as you're told and help push the messages Putin's propaganda is disseminating. The only time Russia cares about corruption is when it gets in the way of state goals. Even now, with the Russian military in a catastrophic state, Vladimir Putin is helpless to enact the anti-corruption measures drastically needed to turn things around, because if he were to do so, he would face mass revolt from the higher echelons of the military and the government. But Russia's training problems have become acute, and now the nation faces a true crisis just when it needs its well-trained troops the most. As the war in Ukraine entered its six-month mark, Russian losses were so severe that it was being forced to reach deep for additional personnel. This is when Russia made a move that baffled Western observers. It began to pull instructors away from its training bases and put them on the front lines. These senior soldiers might have been better trained and more proficient than the losses they were replacing, but by removing this experienced training staff, Russia was ensuring that follow-on reinforcements would not receive the benefit of their lessons and experience. Instead, Russia was forced to install junior training staff with predictably poor results. Russia has officially entered what is known in the West as a military death spiral. This is when a military's best and most proficient soldiers, a term we use very loosely when talking about Russia, are killed or wounded and then replaced with reinforcements that are less trained and proficient, and are subsequently decimated. Their replacements are now even worse prepared for combat and on and on in a death spiral that eats militaries alive. This death spiral is evident across the Ukrainian front, with Russia suffering significant casualties even in what is essentially an offensive that's currently made up of light reconnaissance and force attacks. Ukraine has yet to commit significant combat power to the offensive in a breakthrough operation, and across the entire front, Russian troops are losing ground. 
The losses may only be measured in hundreds of meters, but the fact that they are being pushed back nearly everywhere is a sign of how poorly the Russians are performing. This death spiral is most evident in Russia's aerospace forces, though. Russian pilots are already poorly trained by Western standards, with their American counterparts having four times or more flight hours by the time they graduate to their assigned airframe. When it comes to providing close air support, an element of battle badly needed by Russian troops on the front, Russia's disadvantages are even more significant, with only a fraction of its pilots trained in this role. Famously, during one of the recent incursions into the Belgorod region by Russian partisans, a Russian fighter pilot attempted to bomb partisan forces and missed by an embarrassingly wide margin. Russia has lost 425 aircraft so far in the war in Ukraine, and its Ka-52 attack helicopter fleet has been decimated, with over half of it being destroyed. These losses mean not just the loss of airframes costing tens of millions of rubles, but often their pilots as well, and they're just as hard to replace for a beleaguered Russia. The nation has now been forced to move senior flight instructors to frontline duty, and thanks to a specific Russian doctrine of assigning the most dangerous operations to the most senior pilots, this has resulted in many of them getting killed as well. Now Russian aerospace forces are in significant danger of having a severe training deficit. While this won't mean an end to the war today, as the war evolves Russia's airborne advantage is certain to break. A sign of desperation can be seen in the way Russia has sent its remaining KF-52s into the frontline fighting in recent weeks. Despite staggering casualties in the first year of the war, Russia has sent its attack helicopters to stop Ukrainian thrusts in sheer desperation, resulting in five KA-52s confirmed destroyed in less than a week of fighting. These are completely unsustainable losses, and Russia's aviation is rapidly approaching the point of a critical failure. And that brings us to Russia's other biggest problem. Why can't it replace its combat losses with better equipment? For at least a year, the world has joked about Russia sending in its ancient T-54s and T-55s after stripping them out of museums. Yet as summer began, that's exactly what happened with visual confirmation of these ancient early Cold War tanks being shipped into Ukraine. As it claimed about its old T-62s, Russia said these vehicles would serve as static fortresses and provide long-range fire support. Naturally, this was a lie, and T-55s were confirmed destroyed in combat by Ukraine. Estimates vary, but Russia is believed to be able to produce about 60 tanks a month, but these estimates are muddied by a lack of independent data and the fact that Russia's tank plants both build new tanks and refurbish old ones, without specifically stating the difference. Thus, it's impossible to know if these 60 or so tanks a month are brand new or mostly refurbished Cold War relics. What is known is that Russia loses on average 150 tanks a month, meaning it's not even replacing half of its combat losses. And what it is replacing, it's not doing with very good equipment. At the end of the day, a tank is still a significant threat if you don't have something to deal with it. A T-55 might be a joke, but it's significantly less funny if you're an infantryman without a tank support of your own or an anti-tank guided missile. Luckily, with Western donations of both tanks and ATGMs, Ukraine has both. Not in numbers to match Russia, but enough to achieve a level of battlefield parity due to one big difference between Ukraine and Russia's tanks – technology. Russia's biggest problem in replacing any hardware is the extreme sanctions levied against it by the world. Russia is now the most sanctioned state in history, and these sanctions have effectively eviscerated the Russian defense industry. While the nation builds its own tanks, armored vehicles, aircraft, and missiles, all of these rely on electronics and components made in the West or abroad. Before the war, nearly all optics going to Russian tanks came from the West, and over half the microchips needed in its weapons as well. Ball bearings, which are of critical importance to modern equipment, are difficult to manufacture with a high degree of proficiency, and Russia imported most of those from the West. Now it's forced to alternatives that are of lower quality. But alternatives for other tech simply aren't widely available. Microchips, for example, are of critical importance and Russia has been forced to rely on lower quality Chinese chips as well as those it can smuggle in via alternative means. Russia is quite adept at sanctions busting, but while it's impossible to completely stop Russia from getting Western technology, shutting off the tap means what tech it does get is limited in quantity and much more expensive than it would be on the global market. This limits Russia physically and financially and leads to things such as Russia's new T-80s and T-92s rolling off production lines having gunner sights rather than the sophisticated optics and fire computers. With Ukraine getting access to more and more modern Western armored vehicles, what vehicles Russia can replace on the front are simply no match. This leaves Russia to rely on its artillery advantage, 
but even that has significantly lessened due to a shortage of ammunition. While Russia initially enjoyed a 20 to 1 advantage in artillery, combat losses to precision western systems and a global shortage of ammo has led to that advantage dropping to as little as 6 to 1. To make matters worse, domestically produced ammunition has been found to be of low quality, with thousands of artillery rounds in one shipment declared unfit for use after a series of accidents. Russia's ability to resupply itself is dwindling with every passing month, and thanks to targeted sanctions, the prognosis is not good. The final hope Russia has is for China to finally agree to providing lethal military aid, a move that will draw international condemnation against the Chinese, and possibly even its own sanctions. President Xi Jinping has proven hesitant to cross this red line drawn by the US, but he also has little interest in seeing Russia fail and left weakened, a broken husk that could collapse into a civil war at any time. In order to keep the US on its toes and with its attention split between Asia and Europe, China needs Russia to remain a credible threat to Europe. In time, she might have no choice but to let the tanks roll for Russia, expanding the conflict. But until such a time, Russia's only real advantage over Ukraine is the sheer size of its army, and the Russians' own incredible appetite for casualties. Having suffered horrifically one-sided losses that would have resulted in mass protests in Western nations, Russia appears to remain politically stable, with little sign of the general Russian populace getting ready to rise up and depose Putin. In two or three months from now, is it possible that under the orders of Vladimir Putin, some of the top generals in the Russian army will be taken to the side and filled with bullets courtesy of a Putin-enlisted firing squad? Is mutiny within the Russian ranks on the way? Is Putin even thinking about using a tactical nuke in his home country, no less? This might sound utterly fantastical, but that's what some of the US media was saying recently. Is there any truth to it, or is Russia playing some kind of mind game? The battlefield is one thing, but there's also a war of propaganda wrapped around the bloody conflict in Ukraine, with all sides showing themselves to be adept at constructing narratives from a palette of truths, half-truths, and outright lies. You have to admit, mutiny, executions of top generals, and nuclear strikes aren't exactly small stories, but are they tall stories? The reason we're talking about this is because of Yevgeny Prigozhin, a rich Russian oligarch, a mercenary, and at times a misinformation maverick. He's the guy talking about mutiny and firing squads and nuclear weapon use. Prigozhin is reportedly the chief farmer of Russia's infamous troll farms that have assiduously worked to plant narratives Russia hopes will grow into people's beliefs, especially American people. This is partly why it might be better to treat what he says with a pinch of salt. And then again, maybe Prigozhin is just cracked up under all that stress of fighting, and maybe he's such a maverick that he doesn't mind dissing the commander-in-chief, Mr. Putin. He does, after all, have quite the colorful past, which might encourage a person to believe that Prigozhin just doesn't give a damn. Maybe he'll state the truth regardless of what Putin thinks about it. We need to know more about him and his relationship with Putin before we consider the truthfulness of his words. In 1981, when Prigozhin was just 20, he was arrested and charged with a litany of crimes, including burglary, panhandling, prostitution, gambling, and the nasty-sounding crime of using minors to live parasitically. He was a drunk, a wayward kid from the wrong side of the tracks, who after spending nine years behind bars, ended up selling hot dogs with his mother and stepfather at the local flea market in Leningrad. The boy did well, and as the years passed, he got involved in the grocery store business with a school friend. The two then opened the old customs house, what was said to be St. Petersburg's first elite restaurant. Then they spent $400,000, a lot of money in the 90s, to convert and remodel an old ship, creating another fancy restaurant, this one called New Island. Prigozhin is obviously a bit ashamed of his criminal past. News reports show that he's filed 15 different lawsuits against Yandex, a search engine mainly used in Russia in an attempt to rub his name off the internet under the right to be forgotten laws. On a summer's day in 2001, he met someone who would change his life forever. President Vladimir Putin walked into his New Island restaurant with the then-French president Jacques Chirac. A year later, Putin dined on that transformed ship with none other than US President George W. Bush. Putin even had a birthday party there. He and Prigozhin became close. 
Much later, Prigozhin led a catering contract worth over a billion dollars to feed Putin's soldiers. Later, Prigozhin became the head of Russia's infamous Internet Research Agency, an outfit that is basically a troll farm, writing stories that Russia hopes will turn into full-blown narratives, planting seeds Russia hopes will create disharmony and disunity in the USA. We're not going to do a full bio here, so let's just say that Putin was mightily impressed with Prigozhin's life story and attendant successes, and the two hit it off. They became as thick as thieves. It was a match made in heaven, or hell, depending on where you stand. Just keep this in mind as you watch the rest of the video. Are these two good friends now virtual enemies? Is Prigozhin sincere when he says what he says about everything going wrong in Ukraine? Most people have heard of Prigozhin not because Western presidents once wolfed down expensive wine and foie gras at his maritime-themed restaurant, but because he leads Putin's private army, the Wagner Group. This is not part of the giant Russian army, although it receives equipment from the Russian Ministry of Defense. The group doesn't just provide mercenaries, it works with Russia's military intelligence agency too. It's incredibly useful for Putin, not just on the battlefield. It has long fingers in a lot of pies. In the words of Russia's main intelligence directorate, GRU, former chief of staff Nikolai Makarov, such formidable and dangerous private military companies can be used for delicate missions abroad. Wagner is one of few such mercenary companies that have been involved in conflicts around the world in the name of defending Mother Russia. In 2018, it was discovered that the Wagner Group shared a facility with the 10th Separate Special Purpose Brigade of Russia's GRU, located in Molkino in Russia's Krasnodar district. The Wagner Group is a lot more than hired mercenaries and released convicts who can shoot a gun, even though the reported 50,000 soldiers on its payroll are currently useful in that regard. So we know Prigozhin and Putin are pretty close. The level of trust Putin awards him is as high as it gets. There's a lot we don't know about the Wagner Group, but we know enough to understand it's very important. That's why it can be hard to believe that not long ago Prigozhin said in a video that he expects in two or three months there's a chance that Russia will suffer losses and some of Russia's leading generals will be given the firing squad treatment. As we said, he also talked about Putin using a nuke. We'll come back to the nuke talk later. For now, let's focus on Prigozhin's most notable battle in Ukraine, the Battle of Bakhmut. The eastern Ukrainian town was home to what's been called the longest and bloodiest fight in Russia's war in Ukraine so far. The place has been flattened. The landscape has been turned into a scene perfect for a Hollywood dystopian movie. Bakhmut is the depressing result of a war of attrition, the kind of war some people believe suits Russia, yet others say it'll bring Russia's doom. Depending on which analyst you're reading, you might hear that Bakhmut was a trap set by either Ukraine or Russia to weaken the other side. Pro-Ukrainian pundits of this war will say that Russian combat power was reduced in Bakhmut, all the while Ukraine was just waiting for Western weapons to arrive. In this case, Ukraine set the trap. But you could also make the case for Russia holding out until Ukraine's forces were severely weakened. At the same time, Russia preserved its natural army and let the mercenaries do all the work. Russia lost a lot of convicts, which was no big loss. The question is, which side actually lost in this battle? Whose resources were dangerously depleted while the other side went about strengthening other facets of its forces ready for an all-out attack later? Was the so-called pit of death of Bakhmut as strategically insignificant as many media outlets portrayed it? First, it's doubtful that Bakhmut was as strategically insignificant as was made out. Otherwise, it wouldn't have been fought over the way it was. It was reported that for Ukraine, Bakhmut provided a unique opportunity to kill a lot of Russians and weakened Russia's forces. But for Russia, the fighting was purely symbolic. In this case, it was a huge mistake for Russia, but that's only one way of looking at it. It's hard to believe that maybe 20 or 30,000 Russian men have died because Mr. Putin is afraid of a symbolic loss. Then again, many of the men fighting were convicts, which makes them expendable in the eyes of Putin. Reports state that Ukraine also lost big, although again, different sources paint vastly different pictures. Some sources say way less than Russia, others say just as many Ukrainian soldiers died. Ukraine certainly put a lot of men there. It's thought in total Bakhmut saw 37 Ukrainian brigades, two regiments, and 18 battalions. Would Ukraine have sacrificed so many men, some think 20 to 30,000 just like Russia, as a way to wait for weapons? In one of his rants, Prigozhin said that Wagner had lost 20,000 men in Bakhmut, but he also said that 50,000 Ukrainians had been killed in action. This was after his famous rant, where he threatened to pull his men out of Bakhmut unless they received more support from Russia. 
Later, he extolled what he said was Ukraine's high level of organizational skills, a high level of training, a high level of intelligence. He added they have different types of weapons, and what is most important, they can easily and successfully work with all systems, Soviet, NATO systems, you name it. He was basically telling the world that his enemy was superior. In fact, he blasted Putin and other Russian military bigwigs so much that there's talk that he's trying to get the people behind him so he can make a play to replace Putin. His men have videoed him with their phones, showing him enlisting prisoners to fight or proudly walking through corpse-filled streets in Bakhmut, looking like a fearless soldier. Was this just propaganda to get the Russian people on his side so he might oust Putin? If so, why didn't Putin just have him killed? Not only that, he's criticized high-ranking officials in Russia for corruption, saying such men swan around in Dubai as their children avoid the draft and good men die on the battlefield. Analysts are calling this the Prigozhin brand. One of his latest comments was, We are at such a point that we could bleeping lose Russia. That is the main problem. We need to impose martial law, he said. He concluded his rant by saying that the scenario for us will not be good, and that is why we need to get ready for an arduous war. It's hard to know what to believe. The New Yorker interviewed Ukrainian men on the front line in Bakhmut who said they were totally outgunned. Some reports show that Russia had superiority in artillery. In February, a former U.S. Marine who was in Bakhmut said that men on the front line had a life expectancy of just a few hours. It's very likely that both sides suffered a similar number of casualties, although most of Russia's casualties were those former prisoners. Nonetheless, just the other day, a soldier from Ukraine's 3rd Assault Brigade said the Russians had been pushed back. Still, he said Ukraine is still using Soviet-era weapons that date back to when his parents were his age. More weapons in Russia could be again pushed out, he said. Prigozhin opened his mouth again the other day and said some things that could be construed as shocking. He said the Russian army, the men that had arrived in Bakhmut after his Wagner men had secured the city, were suffering heavy losses. He explained, Now part of the settlement of Berkivka has already been lost. The troops are quietly running away. Disgrace. Berkivka, which is located about two miles northwest of Bakhmut, was taken by Wagner in February. Prigozhin was furious that the Russian army lost it. All that hard work for nothing. So he believed the Russian army was much weaker than his mercenaries, and he let it be known. He went further than that, saying the Ministry of Defense's main goal is to pretend that everything is okay and that we are advancing. In reality, what is happening now will result in significant tactical defeats in two weeks' time. Time and time again, Prigozhin has criticized Russia's Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu, as well as throwing fire at the country's chief of the general staff, Valery Gerasimov. If things couldn't get any crazier, in June, Prigozhin's mercenaries captured the Russian commander of the 72nd Brigade, Lt. Col. Roman Venivitin. They interrogated him with the camera switched on, of course, and made him admit that he'd been drunk on the job and had ordered his troops to fire on Wagner men in a convoy as they were leaving Bakhmut. Venivitin admitted that he didn't much like the Wagner guys and then issued an apology. Prigozhin, who we should remember is a master of misinformation, said he'd found bombs that the Russian defense ministry had planted, bombs that were intended to blow him up. In what sounds like a movie called Laurel and Hardy Go to War, or maybe Carry On Ukraine, Prigozhin then said that the Wagner Group would not sign any more contracts with Russia's forces. It was like a playground fight, all on video for the world to see, which made Putin's Russia seem imbecilic. It looked like Russia's war effort was falling apart from the inside. With Prigozhin gladly airing Russia's dirty laundry in public, then it got even more ridiculous. Prigozhin called the generals smelly scumbags, which would be funny if it weren't for the fact that thousands of men are dying and Ukrainians are seeing their towns turn to rubble. He then screamed, Shoigu, Garasimov, I urge you to come to the front, raise your pistols at your men to make them go forward. Come on, you can. Putin, meanwhile, doesn't seem concerned about this. But why? You'd think he'd be furious and have his good friend Prigozhin torn to pieces by a firing squad, something he could do quite easily. One analyst believes the reason Putin lets the mud fly is to keep the army on its toes. He added, The presence of Prigozhin's media persona not only receives acceptance but is even encouraged. Still, the Western press says that, for the most part, Prigozhin's meltdowns are a sign that Moscow's war machine is in tatters, on the verge of a breakdown. CNN said this is great news for Ukraine as the country moves along, if slowly, with its offensive. A CNN reporter said gleefully, if Prigozhin didn't exist, I think the Ukrainians would be wanting to make him up.
Then again, is CNN seeing the bigger picture here? Are we being advertised a narrative? Is Russia really that cartoonishly incompetent? Or has this narrative actually been made up by people who excel in doing such things? On the face of it, there does indeed look like there's been a total breakdown of order. In one of his latest videos posted on the Telegram app, Prigozhin said Moscow will execute top generals for losing Ukrainian territory. He explained, I think we are two or three months away from the firing squad. Meaning, after Ukraine mows through Russia's forces like a hot knife through columns of butter. Prigozhin went as far as to say that Russia might use nuclear weapons in Belgorod, a border town where there are pro-Ukrainian Russian volunteer units. This would mean Putin nuking his own country, upsetting the international community and possibly starting a nuclear war. If some of you think Prigozhin's latest rants sound like theater, you wouldn't be alone. We don't imagine US intelligence watched that video with any amount of concern or interest, certainly not enough interest to make any strategic decisions over. Nonetheless, you have to ask the question, if this is a close friend of Putin, a trusted ally really vying to get the Russian people on his side and perhaps replace Putin. After all, the videos look real to Russians too. Has Prigozhin really lost the plot? Is there so much disunity and chaos on the front line that Ukraine will walk right through this next offensive? If Prigozhin is telling the truth, that should happen, but are things really as bad as he makes out? The answer, according to some analysts, is that it definitely won't happen like that. Ukraine won't just walk right through Russia's troops with ease while their leaders squabble like children. Many of these people think this will be a protracted war of attrition. Some of them believe Russia is in a better position to win a war of attrition since it has more soldiers, especially after Ukraine lost so many of its soldiers fighting in Bakhmut. Others say Ukraine is better suited to a war of attrition, but no one's walking through anyone. But you have to ask then, what the hell is Prigozhin up to? Some pundits have said his ranting is related to the Russian expression maskerovka. This literally means mask or masking. But in military and strategic sense, we can say it's all about confusing the enemy and its supporters. An analyst explained, it's a public spectacle to shape the perception of those external actors watching. After all, while Prigozhin might look dumb, life is not a Hollywood movie. He's obviously very smart, and he obviously has a background in psychological operations. Russia's pretending its army is in disarray is not exactly a genius bit of misdirection. Still, it seems that some people believe it. Much of the Western media has ran with the narrative, reporting it to make Ukraine look like it's on the verge of winning the conflict. In short, Prigozhin might be orchestrating an exaggerated disarray that Putin wants Ukraine and the West to believe because believing your enemy is weak when it is not is a powerful thing in a war. The Western media might be selling the disarray as real, so people believe the war is almost won when it certainly isn't. It's very hard to discern what is real in this war, and anyone who says they know exactly what the truth is would be lying. Just recently, the Kakhovka Dam in the Kherson region was blown up, a dam already in the hands of the Russians. This is a new kind of threat to Ukrainian civilians. Tens of thousands of people had to be evacuated, while flooding destroys not just houses but agriculture. It's a terrible thing to happen to the Ukrainian people, with the whole event being called an ecocide. It makes Russia look really bad. But who did it? The same question we asked about the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, and we got different answers with accusations being thrown around depending on what media and, more importantly, what genuine experts you read. Ukrainian security forces said they had proof, a phone call they intercepted which suggested the Russians blew up the dam. A spokesman said the invaders wanted to blackmail Ukraine by blowing up the dam and staging a man-made disaster in the south of our country. Poland came right out and said blowing up that dam should result in more sanctions against Russia. The US just said it's constantly monitoring the situation. Russia has denied it, of course. Kremlin spokesperson Dmitry Peskov said the attack was planned and carried out by order received from Kyiv from the Kyiv regime, with the aim to deprive Crimea of water and to distract from what's happening on the battlefield. There's a video that has been making the rounds on social media that shows a Ukrainian blogger talking to an alleged Russian soldier with the soldier saying that the Russian army mined the Kakovka Dam, although that evidence is weak. There's no proof that the guy is even a soldier. Some have said he's actually a Ukrainian impersonator named Yehor. 
Then you have the other side of the tale. In December 2022, the Washington Post published an article in which a Ukrainian commander talks about blowing up dams. The Post wrote, The Ukrainians, he said, even conducted a test strike with high Mars launcher on one of the floodgates at the Nova Kakovka Dam, making three holes in the metal to see if the Dnieper's water could be raised enough to stymie Russian crossings but not flood nearby villages. The test was a success, Kovalchuk said, but the step remained a last resort. You have to ask which side the blowing up of the dam serves the most. The answer is very likely the side that did it, despite what else you might hear. It's very possible that Prigozhin's prediction of the imminent collapse of Russian forces and subsequent executions of generals by firing squad, or even that nuclear attack, won't come true. If it happens, we'll be shocked. Prigozhin and Putin might just be playing games here. It seems Ukraine has certainly advanced in its offensive. We've seen videos of flags being raised in different liberated towns and villages across the front, but these successes, at least when we started making this video, have been small. The day we started making the video, Putin said Ukraine's offensive is a failure, telling a bunch of war correspondents that Ukraine had suffered catastrophic losses. Meanwhile, Ukraine said it had just killed 680 Russian soldiers and taken out eight tanks and an air defense system. Putin then had his shot at the narrative and said, They, Ukraine, lost over 160 tanks, we lost 54 tanks, and some of them are subject to restoration and repair. He said since June 4th, Ukraine has lost 10 times more soldiers than Russia had. And back and forth the story goes on like this, with the narrative changing shape like 10,000 birds in a giant murmuration. While the soundtrack in the background is Prigozhin mad as a hatter, either away with the fairies or actually angry or just playing his part in this misinformation operation as Putin smiles on in his Moscow office. Right now it's too early to tell with any confidence what's true and not true when it comes to many matters involving Ukraine. It's likely this war will go on for a long time to come and everything we hear needs to be scrutinized. The truth is out there, but it's never delivered to us in bite-sized parcels that makes everything seem very simple. Read the news like you're trying to complete a difficult puzzle, reading into angles and counter-angles as if you're playing chess with a grand master, because things really are rarely as simple as they're reported. It's no secret the world is largely united against Russia and its invasion of Ukraine, but it might surprise you just how the Russian people feel about this invasion. To understand the Russian people and their support for Vladimir Putin, First, you have to understand Russian culture and society. Unlike many countries who experienced great evil in the past, Russians never truly came to terms with the abuses of the Soviet Union. In fact, most Russians today still believe that Joseph Stalin was a great man, despite the fact that he imprisoned and killed millions of his own people. In 2016, the dead dictator's approval rating was 54% in a poll conducted by the Moscow Times. In 2019, though, 70% of Russians polled by the independent Levada Center said that Stalin played a favorable role for Russia. Over half of those surveyed even said that they personally viewed Stalin favorably. In May of 2021, a new poll showed that 56% of Russians viewed Stalin as a great leader. South Africa actively strode for racial reconciliation after apartheid. The United States has made civil rights for people of color and other minorities a front and center issue in domestic politics for decades and Germany has completely denounced its Nazi past and actively works to educate its own children on the horrors of the regime, convinced that such a thing should never happen again. All of these countries and more have acknowledged their past and taken responsibility for it, while taking steps to rehabilitate their societies from the ill effects of said past. It may be an ongoing process in some cases, but the fact that it's happening at all is what's important. Russia has never experienced a collective reconciliation over the brutality of the Soviet regime. And this explains much about the current attitudes on Putin's invasion of Ukraine. Rather than acknowledge all the evils of leaders like Stalin and the great economic and physical harm caused by the Soviet Union, the Russian people have shifted the blame to various groups. A common sentiment in response to the evils of the Soviets is that it was the Bolsheviks. Bafflingly, sometimes Russia's favorite bogeyman, the United States, is to blame. Culpability is constantly deflected from one group to another, and the Russian people aren't completely to blame for this lack of self-accountability. Since 2021, it's been illegal in Russia to deny that the Soviet Union played a decisive role in overcoming fascism in World War II, and it's likewise illegal to equate the war crimes of the Soviet Union, of which there were many, with those committed by Nazi Germany. In Russian schools, history is taught selectively, with many of the Soviet regime's worst abuses either played down or simply not taught. Vladimir Putin even went to great lengths to spin the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact between the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany as a diplomatic victory 
This pact outlined how Eastern Europe would be carved out by the two world powers and was so shameful even to Soviet leaders that Mikhail Gorbachev publicly denied it and attempted to rewrite the history behind the pact. This time of historical rewriting by Vladimir Putin's administration helps us to understand why so many Russians support the war in Ukraine today. In 2005, just a few years after Putin's ascension to power, 40% of those polled agreed that Stalin had absolutely decimated the Red Army's leadership prior to World War II with his paranoid purges. This is of course a matter of historical fact, and the reason why the Soviets performed so astonishingly poorly during the Winter War against a much smaller Finland. Yet in 2021, only 17% of respondents agreed on the 2005 question. Putin has spent considerable resources to rewrite Russia's understanding of their own history, fully in preparation for his orchestration of a return to a repressive Soviet time, under his firm leadership, of course. Anyone who tries to bring up real history of the Soviet Union is painted as a foreign agent, probably American ones at that, as Putin has turned the US into a national boogeyman who's hiding under every bed and in every closet. His total information control doesn't just extend to the past though, but also to the present, as media in Russia now is the least free it's been since the strictest days of censorship during the Soviet Union. Journalists who dug too deep into issues the Kremlin did not want exposed, or who wrote articles the Kremlin didn't like, were often discovered dead or missing. For a while, Russia was officially one of the most dangerous places to be a reporter in, and this included places like active war zones in Africa or in the Middle East. After the invasion of Ukraine, Putin's control over the media has only tightened to the point that the average Russian receives a steady diet of pure propaganda. It's now illegal in Russia to refer to the war in Ukraine as anything other than a special military operation, and this law is enforced with steep fines and as many as 15 years in prison. Putin has also passed a law that is in essence the widest sweeping form of censorship that Russia has seen in decades. It's not just illegal to call the war anything other than a special military operation, but it's also illegal to write, post, or say anything meant to hurt Russian morale or spread misinformation. What actually counts as hurting Russian morale or misinformation is, of course, left up to the Kremlin. This gives Putin and his administration incredible power to shape narratives on the war in Ukraine any way they wish. So, how do Russians feel about the war? Given Russia's lack of free speech and government interference in most media, getting accurate data is rather difficult. However, polls conducted by independent and not-so-independent agencies across Russia since the start of the invasion all clearly show overwhelming support for the Russian invasion of Ukraine. One survey showed 65% were in favor of the invasion, while a second showed 71. Independent polls routinely show figures above 50% approval. How can so many Russians support one of the most horrific conflicts in Europe since World War II? There's a reason why Putin has insisted the war be called a special military operation. It's careful phrasing that's meant to encourage the Russian people that there is no war, just a low-grade military operation. This is no different than a military operation the US might undertake to eliminate a new Al-Qaeda cell in a remote corner of Africa. Military operations are routine and even more importantly not very wide-sweeping. This is important because despite the two nations having taken wildly different paths since the fall of the Soviet Union, Ukraine is still seen as a brother nation to most Russians. The two share much of the same history and culture, and large amounts of the population speak the same language. The kinship was so close that before the war, Russian troops in the first few weeks of fighting were genuinely shocked that they'd been greeted not as liberators, but as invaders and occupiers. Putin admitting to the Russian people that he was launching a full-scale invasion of Ukraine would be like President Biden announcing that the United States was going to invade Britain. It's an unthinkable proposition for the American people to see themselves at war with a nation they consider to be a true brother nation. And likewise, the Russian people would be shocked to find out the truth about the brutality of Russian actions inside Ukraine. The careful language allows Putin to minimize this outrage, but also allows him to craft the narrative that he needs to continue gaining Russian support. By framing the invasion as a special military operation, Putin has convinced many of the Russian people that this war is actually about securing the safety of the Russian-speaking population of Donbas. But Putin still needed a boogeyman, someone that the Russian people would see as an enemy, and that's why he tapped into history. Putin's public justification for the invasion was that he was cleansing Ukraine of the threat of neo-Nazism. To the world, this is a ridiculous proposition, but to many Russians, it's an issue near and dear to their hearts. Their nation, after all, suffered more than any other at the hands of the Nazis during the Second World War. Thus, by painting this as a conflict against a resurgence of Nazism that threatened fellow Russian speakers, Putin was able to portray this as a heroic and moral war. The fact that these imaginary Nazis are right outside Russia's border 
only helps those spinning this war as a fight against fascism. Even the fact that Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky is Jewish has been spun by Russian propagandists who point out that Hitler also had Jewish blood in him. When Russia immediately ran into trouble inside Ukraine, not even the tightest of information control could stop the slow realization that this was no small-scale military operation. Russia was at full-scale war, and its military needed to mobilize as such. The impact of the fighting is so intense that an estimated 20% of all Russian tanks have been destroyed, though this relies only on visual confirmation, and thus the real total is indubitably much higher. 3,342 armored vehicles have been confirmed destroyed, damaged, abandoned, or captured by Ukrainian forces. 115 combat aircraft have also been destroyed, damaged, or captured. Now Putin needed to justify the broadening of the special military operation into full-scale war, and to do this, he once more summoned the favorite Russian boogeyman, the United States of America. The new narrative is that NATO, at the behest of the US, is fighting a proxy war against Russia while extremists inside of Ukraine pull the strings and force their army and population to fight a war they don't really want to. Casualties are estimated to have reached as high as 20,000 dead, with Ukraine claiming to have confirmed 18,900 as of April 8, via bodies they have personally collected or intercepted intelligence reports. Yet the Kremlin has cleverly spun this as the work of NATO and the US, thus rallying the Russian people against the much-hated West. But not all Russians support the invasion. In fact, 6,500 people were arrested across 53 cities in Russia during February 24th to March 2nd in anti-war protests as tens of thousands took to the streets. However, the passage of new censorship laws have taken the wind out of the sails of any Russians who oppose the invasion, as they live in fear of arrest for their anti-war views. Russian police have even been documented searching vehicles and homes for evidence of anti-war sentiments, and Russia is slowly reverting back to a Soviet-era culture of neighbors snitching on neighbors. One thing is clear though, while most Russians support the war in Ukraine, young Russians are the demographic most likely to not support the invasion. And since the start of the war, hundreds of thousands of them have left Russia. Turkey has become a hotbed of anti-war, anti-Putin sentiment among Russians who have fled their own country as the EU will not allow passage for anyone with a Russian passport. While Russia has disconnected much of global social media from itself, young Russians are more likely to be able to know how to bypass national internet blocks via VPNs, and this exposes them to international news where they can see the truth about the consequences of the brutal war in Ukraine. Translating that to the older population, however, has not been as successful, and many young Russians report they no longer speak with parents or grandparents over their difference of views on the war. Putin may have the support of the majority of the population, but he has very little support amongst the two segments of the population that matter the most, young people and military conscripts. With conscripts making up a quarter of Russian forces, by the end of the war there will be tens of thousands of Russian conscripts returning home with their own version of the war to share. Here it's important to note that the February Revolution of 1917 which overthrew the Tsar was largely premeditated by the return of thousands of disillusioned troops from their time on the front. As casualties mount, the reality of the war will begin to sink home with average Russians who have lost husbands, brothers, and fathers in Ukraine. And Putin won't be able to deflect for long the anger of thousands of families grieving loved ones by blaming the West. There's been talk for months now of when the Ukrainian counteroffensive will start, whether it's already begun, where it'll take place, what forces Ukraine will need to punch through the Russian defenses, whether they have enough tanks and artillery to last for the entire offensive, and whether the offensive will ultimately be successful. Part of the reason there's so much speculation is because the Ukrainian government and its military have taken extraordinary measures to keep their plans and their military disposition quiet, so as to not tip off the Russians as to their plans and avenues of attack. One of the problems with the impending offensive is the high expectation of success that many observers have. Last September's stunningly successful drives east of Kherson and south into Kharkiv took so much ground so quickly that many people expect the same lightning-fast results for the upcoming offensive. But this time, the Russians have been preparing their defenses for more than six months. They've brought in many more troops and artillery and are supported by better trained and equipped support forces. Some military analysts in the West doubt that Ukraine can retake all their occupied terrain before the wet weather of fall and winter sets in. But those doubts have persisted around Ukraine's mere ability to defend themselves against the Russian invasion since the opening stages of the invasion. Three months into the war, historians Ileana Fix and Michael Kimmage argued that a full-scale Ukrainian military defeat of Russia, including the retaking of Crimea, verges on fantasy. Thankfully, they and most other Western analysts were wrong about the will of the Ukrainian population 
to resist Russian occupation and overlooked both the amount of support NATO and the US would provide as well as overestimating the strength and coordination of the Russian invaders. But as Ukraine's counteroffensive begins to take shape, there are still quite a few questions that remain to be answered. The first, oddly enough, is whether the counteroffensive has actually begun. The three conditions for the counteroffensive to begin. Russian President Vladimir Putin has no doubts. He stated publicly on June 9th that he believed the offensive had begun in earnest. Other commentators pointed to June 4th as the date when the Ukrainian forces began their attacks in earnest which explains why two days later, Russian forces blew up the Kakovka Dam on the Dnipro River in order to widen the river downstream. That in turn would allow Russia to pull troops from that region and reinforce other areas where the attacks were more likely to occur. Many analysts had been watching for certain key requirements to determine whether Ukraine felt comfortable enough to launch their major counterattacks. Retired U.S. Lieutenant General Ben Hodges wrote in an article for the Center for European Policy Analysis, or SEPA, on June 11, when we see two or three Ukrainian brigades around 500 to 750 armored vehicles focused on a narrow front, it will be then possible to say that the main attack has probably started and where it's happening. Until then, Hodges said, what we're seeing are initial probing efforts by Ukraine with minimal forces. A few tanks here, a dozen or less IFVs like the US Bradley over there, rather than the full brunt of a major attack. The Ukrainian military commander-in-chief, General Valery Zalushny, has been hailed as a hero for coordinating the defense of Kyiv in the early days of the war. Since then, he's been tasked with coordinating all of Ukraine's military forces and is the man who will make the decision on when and where to commit Ukraine's strategic reserves for any successful attack. General Hodges in his June 11th article said there were likely three overall preconditions that would need to be met before Zaluzhny would give the green light. Has Ukraine gathered enough combat brigades, primarily armored brigades, with sufficient numbers of tanks and infantry fighting vehicles, supported by engineers, artillery, and air defense units, along with the extensive logistical support to keep them all functioning? Will these forces be able to punch through multiple lines of defense that Russia has built throughout eastern Ukraine? Will they have enough strength to achieve the majority of their goals against the occupying Russian forces? These goals will most likely include cutting off Russian connections to the Crimean Peninsula, while also securing significant cities such as Mariupol and Melitopol, while securing Zaporizhia nuclear power station, the largest nuclear station in all of Europe. Would the Russian defenses and logistics stockpiles have been sufficiently degraded? This would include attacking Russian rear areas where artillery and fuel have been stockpiled while also attacking bridges and transportation nodes throughout the occupied portion of Ukraine. From such attacks, Ukraine would hope to confuse the Russian command and control structure about the direction and coordination of the Ukrainian offensive, while also degrading their ability to respond with adequate reinforcements and supplies. And lastly, would the ground be dry enough to support the movement of hundreds of heavy tracked armored vehicles as well as their less mobile wheeled supply transports. While currently the ground is sufficiently dry and firm enough for cross-country travel, this has not been the case for most of the spring all the way through mid-May. Where will Ukraine strike? Retired U.S. Brigadier General Mark Kimmett, who's seen combat in Bosnia, Kosovo, and Iraq, spoke with the Wall Street Journal on May 23rd. He suggested that Ukraine had four likely avenues of attack. First, from the region of Kherson in the northwest corner of occupied territories due east to the Sea of Azov, cutting off the Crimean Peninsula. However, the recent destruction of the Novokakovka Dam has made crossing that section of the Dnipro River south of Kherson much more difficult, at least for the time being. That leaves three other main axes of advance. His second choice was the western region of Zaporizhia Oblast, south toward the rail hub of Tokmak, and then further south to the port of Berdyansk on the Sea of Azov. Kimmett pointed out there are good roads through this area, making advances in both wheeled and tracked vehicles easier. But as Ukraine discovered with their initial probing attacks in the region, the roads are heavily mined, as is the ground on both sides. Russian artillery units also have these areas sighted in, so their artillery fire is more accurate than normal Russian counter-artillery. But the terrain is mostly flat ground all the way south, so it's good terrain for highly maneuverable tracked units. Kimmet's third choice is in the Donetsk Oblast south and southeast toward Mariupol. Losing that city early in the war was a significant defeat for the Ukrainians, and retaking it would be an equally significant defeat for Russia. Though the city itself has almost no inhabitable buildings still standing, it does still have port facilities, which would still be useful to Russian resupply efforts. The port needs to be captured or otherwise denied to the Russians. His fourth option would be for Ukraine to attack due east from the Kharkiv area toward Luhansk near the Russian border, 
Such an offensive would send a clear message to the Russian people that Ukraine's forces are strong enough to force Russian troops back onto their own soil. If Ukraine was able to close off this section of the border, it would do as much to deny logistical support to the remaining Russian occupation as capturing Crimea and all the ports on the Sea of Azov put together. A closer look at the terrain ahead. The eastern region of Zaporizhia has two parallel defensive lines running west to east, while the western half of the region has three lines. Each of these lines is separated by a distance of 8 to 10 miles from the one south of it. Russian strategy is to abandon the first line when they're about to be overrun and retreat, or as the Russian general staff calls it, redeploying in force to the next line. These defensive lines include extensive trench networks, reinforced strong points, dug in tanks, machine gun and mortar emplacements, all backed up by more distant artillery units, and the ability to call in helicopter gunships and ground attack fighters. One of the more extensive defensive systems surrounds the key transportation hub of Tokmak, which sits about 12 to 15 miles south of the third Russian defensive line. While these defenses are indeed extensive, there is some doubt from Western intelligence experts that Russia has enough trained troops to sufficiently man these fortifications. Ukraine's plan is to probe these defenses all along the front, determine where they're the weakest, and push their armored brigades forward from there. Tokmak is a natural deep penetration target for any Ukrainian breakthrough. A successful capture of Tokmak will provide Ukraine with two advantages. First, it'll cut the main rail line that runs from there southwest to Melitopol and beyond to the Crimean Peninsula. That will only leave the Kirk Bridge into Crimea from mainland Russia as the sole source of supply and reinforcements for almost a third of the Russian defense forces in Ukraine. If Ukraine begins to advance beyond Tokmak, the Russian defenders may start cutting their losses and retreat. If that happens, the limited approaches to the bridge will become a highly congested choke point. More importantly, capturing Tokmak would mean that the Ukraine forces will have breached the last line of Russian defenses south of the Dnipro River. There are additional unconnected trench and strongpoint networks scattered across the rest of the Zaporizhia Oblast, as well as significant series of defenses at the very northern edge of Crimea itself. But the primary east-west axis of Russian trenches will have been breached. From Tokmak, the Ukrainian army can continue 40 miles southwest to Melitopol, further boxing in the remaining Russian forces there, or head 100 miles east to Mariupol, one of the two key ports on the Sea of Azov still open to Russian forces. Berdyansk is the other key port, lying another 53 miles further east of Mariupol. Both ports have been under repeated bombardment since early May 2023 from Ukrainian long-range missiles, especially the newly arrived Storm Shadow. These attacks have reduced the effectiveness of these ports as loading and supply facilities. As Ukrainian forces edge closer to these two main ports, the Ukrainian artillery will also play a role in denying access to Russian ships. At some point, the remaining Russian forces will have to decide whether to retreat east to the oblasts of Donetsk or Luhansk, or to turn southwest and head for the Crimean Peninsula. By the time Ukrainian artillery is within range of the ports, about 130 to 150 miles away, no Russian ships will be able to supply troops safely. But will Ukraine be able to break through the multiple layers of Russian defenses? Will they be able to neutralize Russia's superiority in ground attack aircraft? Will Ukraine take these cities before they run out of armored brigades, artillery shells, and rockets? Available Ukrainian Resources Multiple Western sources report that, according to their best estimates, Ukraine has between 10 and 12 armored combat brigades, held in reserve until Ukrainian leadership has determined where the weakest point in the Russian defenses are. When that decision's been made, they'll commit elements from this massive reserve and punch a hole into the less defended rear areas. How large is this reserve force? A Ukrainian tank battalion normally has around 500 combat soldiers or more, with 31 tanks and an equivalent number of armored infantry vehicles. An armored infantry battalion would have about the same number. There'd be additional vehicles for carrying engineers, air defense units, logistics and support troops, as well as more standard infantry and replacement troops. An armored brigade would likely consist of three tank battalions and two mechanized infantry battalions. In total, then, an armored brigade is going to have around 250 to 300 armored vehicles, a little less than half of which would be tanks, and as many as 4,000 troops. There are Western estimates that the Ukrainians have gathered from 7 to 12 armored brigades. Some may only have Ukrainian or captured Russian equipment, while others will have a mix of Western-provided vehicles, which currently include Leopard tanks and Bradley Infantry Fighting Vehicles, or IFVs. When we see two or three of those brigades, around 500 to 750 armored vehicles, focused on a narrow front, it'll then be possible to say that the main attack has probably started and that's where Ukraine is hoping to break through.
But even then, we have to be careful. The Ukrainian general staff will want to keep the Russians guessing about the location of the main attack for as long as possible, and they won't be too bothered and will probably welcome social media bloggers getting it wrong. If the West provides everything the Ukrainian armed forces need, especially long-range precision weapons like the US Attackums, then some analysts anticipate that Ukraine can recapture Crimea, taking the peninsula and denying Russia's Black Sea Fleet their anchorage in Sevastopol would clearly be one of Ukraine's primary goals of the offensive. If the UAF can get to within 150 miles of Sevastopol and the smaller ports of Saki and Zankoy, their long-range artillery and storm shadow missiles would make using those ports impossible for the Russian Navy. By forcing the Russian missile armed ships further away from Crimea, Ukraine will be better able to defend against the numerous missile attacks Russia has been lobbing at Ukrainian population centers, while giving their air defense systems more time to intercept missiles aimed at cities like Kyiv and Odessa. The overall aim of the offensive, which has been stated many times by Ukrainian President Zelensky, is to liberate the illegally occupied areas based on our constitutionally defined legitimate borders, which are recognized internationally. Though it may be a tall order to recapture all the occupied territory, it's hoped that losing Crimea and a significant portion of the territory in the south and east of the country might convince the majority of Russia, if not Putin himself, that their continued aggression is meaningless. Can the counteroffensive succeed? One of the most significant indicators of whether the Ukrainian counteroffensive can succeed is the level of casualties the Russian army will sustain. According to a Ukrainian reporter for the Kyiv Post, Russia's military has already reached the point where more than 50% of their armed forces have been killed or wounded and unable to continue their service. When a unit reaches that 50% loss status, they're considered combat ineffective. To have the entire Russian army considered combat ineffective is a horrifying aspect for Russian commanders to deal with. The same report announced that in the 10 days of the initial phase of the counteroffensive, Russia has lost an additional 7,390 troops killed and an additional 15 to 22,000 wounded. That's a staggering number of casualties in just 10 days. These losses are also before the vast majority of Ukrainian armored brigades have even been committed to the offensive. The ratio of wounded to dead soldiers reflects how badly Russia cares for its wounded troops. The ratio is far worse, meaning more wounded troops die after being wounded than, for example, the US rate during World War II, which was four surviving soldiers for every one that died in action. In Vietnam, a 5 to 1 ratio, and much worse than US fighting in Iraq, 10 surviving soldiers for every soldier killed. By comparison, Ukraine's rate has been estimated to be 10 to 1 or better. Much of Ukraine's success can be attributed to having a more advanced medical system than Russia, as well as many more volunteers helping out with Ukraine's wounded soldiers. An aggregate of Ukrainian, Western intelligence, and Russian military bloggers have also reported that as of June 14th, Ukraine may have destroyed as many as 80 Russian tanks and 140 armored vehicles, along with more than 240 artillery and rocket systems in that same 10-day stretch. The Ukrainian general staff reported on June 11th that Russia has lost 17 tanks and 24 armored personnel vehicles in just a single day of the offensive. These numbers, even if a little on the optimistic side, point to a disastrous overall Russian loss that won't be sustained over the course of the continued offensive. We must ask, what are Ukraine's overall aims of their offensive? If it's to retake all of Ukraine back to its pre-2014 borders, before Russia made its first incursions, then that might take some time, but it's certainly doable. It's even more possible when additional US and Western forces arrive in the country. Ukraine is awaiting 31 promised US Abrams tanks, enough for a tank battalion, and up to 100 F-16s from both NATO countries and possibly from Australia as well. Tank crews and pilots are already being trained on these new weapons, but it'll take time to get this equipment into Ukraine along with the repair and support logistics needed to keep them maintained and serviced. British Challenger 2 tanks are also on their way. However, if it comes to Ukraine convincing Putin to halt his aggressive foreign policy and de-escalate this militaristic approach to his neighbors, many analysts see that it's never going to happen. Maxim Samurukov, a fellow at the Carnegie Russia Eurasian Center, wrote in June for Foreign Policy that the war has allowed Putin to work toward his ideal vision of Russia helped by numerous Asian-directed transport and energy links to a society less reliant on the US dollar. The share of Russian exports paid in US dollars fell from 90% prior to the invasion to less than 50% in December 2022. Of course, that drop-off is mostly due to the sanctions placed on Russia by the US and the EU, sanctions that have crippled Russia's economy. 
but as long as Putin and his oligarchs, who held the real power in the country, don't feel the effects of the sanctions too much, and as long as Putin can shield the residents of Moscow and St. Petersburg from the direct effects of the war, especially the mobilization of conscripts, he'll feel safe in the coming war. He's made every effort to force the poorer and less urban areas of Russia to bear the brunt of the draft. According to an October 2022 report by the investigative outlet iStories, in cooperation with the War Monitoring Group Conflict Intelligence Team, or CIT, 23 of the 26 regions with the highest proportion of recruits have incomes below the national average. The conscription has caused labor shortages in Siberia's Krasnoyarsk region, which reported the highest share of mobilized reservists nationwide at 5.5%. The Sevastopol region in southern Russia reported recruitment totals of 4%, while the republics of Buryatia and Dagestan, two of Russia's poorest regions that have already suffered the highest death tolls in Ukraine, recruited 3.7 and 2.6% respectively. By contrast, Moscow and St. Petersburg recruited well below 1% of their reservists, according to iStories and CIT calculations. So, this may be why the Ukrainian allied forces have begun sending drone attacks against Moscow. Some argue that the attacks have been targeted to the affluent suburbs of Rubloyovka, where many oligarchs, high government officials, and other elites maintain expensive homes and mansions. Public opinion for the invasion has reached as high as 90% in Russia's tightly script and heavily controlled mediascape. But attacks on Moscow's elite have brought some measure of acceptance from the average Muscovite who even see sanctions on oligarchs as a good thing. Ukraine's counteroffensive is indeed in place and making its first significant attacks. The majority of their armored brigades have yet to see combat, and when they do, their impact will be extensive. If Ukraine can continue to keep Russia's numerically superior air force away from ground attack roles by employing significant numbers of manned portable air defense systems or man pads, and if they can continue to eliminate Russian artillery with accurate counter-battery fire, then there is every indication that Ukraine can retake significant portions of their country, including Crimea. Continued probing attacks over the course of the next few weeks, until the first weeks of July, will determine how soon Ukraine can direct where the hammer will fall. And when that hammer does fall, the morale of the Russian army, heavily made up of conscripts with little training and without the motivation to die in a foreign land for Putin's folly, may break. When Ukrainian armored brigades begin roaming unchallenged through the majority of the Zaporizhia and Donetsk oblasts, the defeat of the invasion may finally be at hand. In the past few weeks, the war in Ukraine has escalated again, with Russia attacking a range of targets across the country, including the capital, Kyiv. One deadly and terrifying part of this new wave of attacks has been the use of so-called kamikaze drones to blow up both energy infrastructure and civilian targets. But what do we actually know about these drones? Where are they coming from? And what does their use mean for war in Ukraine? Officially called the Sahed-136, or in Russian, the Geron-2, these drones were developed and manufactured by the Iranian government. Only entering service last year, the Sahed-136 is a triangular-shaped autonomous drone which dives toward its target and explodes on impact, destroying everything around its crash site. Each drone is about 11 feet long, weighs 440 pounds, and carries a roughly 88-pound warhead. Typically fired five or more at a time from a launch rack mounted on the back of a truck, they reportedly have a range of over 1,500 miles. This means they can be launched far from the front line of a conflict and are able to loiter around a particular location for hours at a time, attacking only when their target is located. Ukrainian officials have stated that the drones are being fired from three Russian bases in Crimea and another position in Belarus. But these drones are also relatively slow, noisy, and fly at a low altitude making them easy targets for both traditional air defenses and even armed individuals. To get around this problem, they rely on numbers, with several Sahed drones usually striking at an area at the same time. This has proved difficult for Ukraine to counter, as even if one drone is destroyed, several more will likely still reach the target. Since the 10th of October, Sahed drones have played a major part in destroying nearly a third of Ukraine's power stations and killing dozens of civilians around the country. But why is Russia using these drones? There seems to be multiple reasons. First, their use might be a sign that Russia's military is running low on its traditional precision-guided ballistic and cruise missiles, which were used to damage the power grid, ammunition depots, and other strategic Ukrainian targets. Sahed drones have allowed Russia to continue this practice, even as its military continues to lose ground in the south and northeast of Ukraine. The drones are also important because Russia has so far failed to establish air superiority, putting its manned aircraft at a huge risk when flying into Ukrainian territory. Since Sahed drones are autonomous, Russia can still achieve its goals of destroying targets deep behind enemy lines without risking its dwindling supply of pilots. 
Finally, Sahed drones are relatively cheap weapons, costing between $20,000 and $50,000 each. This makes them ideal for Russia, whose economy has been seriously harmed by sanctions and the growing cost of its invasion. But does this low cost mean that these drones don't pack the same punch as conventional smart weapons? While the Sahed drone's 88-pound payload is quite small by military standards, their precision targeting makes them potentially devastating. In combat, they can explode near weapons, ammunition, or other combustible materials to greatly increase their damage. They also have created a new risk for Ukrainian forces, which had grown used to dealing with Russian missiles and artillery strikes. In contrast, the drone's targeting is much more unpredictable, and Ukraine only recently announced that it was able to shoot down a majority of them. The drone's extreme portability also makes them a dangerous and unpredictable threat. A truck full of Saheds can engage in hit-and-run tactics by launching them and then leaving the area before a retaliatory strike can take place. Finally, even if the drones are destroyed over major cities, they can still cause major collateral damage when they fall to the ground. All of these features make the Sahed-136 a cheap but extremely powerful weapon, especially since the financial toll of destroying a drone vastly exceeds the costs of each one. But with all these sanctions placed on Russia, who has been brave enough to supply them with the weapons? The answer is Iran, but the reasoning behind this dubious collaboration might be worrying. Although the two countries have not always been friendly with one another, in the 21st century they are united by their hatred for the West. Bad news for those who thought that Russia will run out of weapons. Their current cooperation goes back to 2015, when Russia used its air force to intervene in the Syrian civil war. Iran was also involved in the conflict, supplying weapons and training to paramilitary groups. Together, the two countries worked to prop up their mutual ally, Syrian dictator Bashar al-Assad. Russian warplanes and Iranian-backed ground troops successfully kept Assad in power, while also acting as a slap in the face to Western countries. The war in Ukraine has provided another opportunity to work together, as Iran can prove to the world that it too can produce powerful military equipment. It also gives Iran a chance to field test these new weapons and give a display of just how much its military capabilities have improved in the past few years. Iran has also dispatched advisors to the Russian-occupied areas of Ukraine, who are reportedly providing the Russian drone operators with technical instruction. While Iran's government has officially denied selling the Sahed drones to Russia, analysts say there is clear evidence that they have. U.S. and Ukrainian intelligence services have claimed that Russia ordered around 600 of the drones at the beginning of the summer, about 250 of which have been so far deployed. Their presence in Russia is also backed up by other statements from the Iranian military. A major general in Iran recently said that major world powers are using Iranian-made arms. While its cyber warfare chief posted on Twitter that this head drone was now the most talked about weapon in the world. This trend reverses the usual pattern of large countries selling weapons to smaller ones and means that Russia now has a reliable source of new weapons to continue the conflict. But by using Iranian-made drones, Russia now risks drawing in more international actors who support Ukraine. The most important of these might be Iran's political nemesis, Israel, which has so far remained neutral in the Ukraine war due to its complex relations with Russia. But on October 16th, Israeli cabinet minister Nachman Sa'i tweeted that Sahed drones removed any doubt where Israel should stand, urging military and economic support for Ukraine. Iran's growing alliance with Russia also makes a new nuclear deal between Iran and the West unlikely, an outcome favorable to Israel, which opposed the original agreement in 2015. But what does all this mean for Ukraine? Even though Ukrainian troops have continued to retake territory to the east, because of this new steady supply of modern military equipment, the conflict is unlikely to end anytime soon. With the Sahed drones and other Iranian weapons, Russia can continue its mass destruction of power stations, ammunition depots, and even civilian targets like apartment buildings. Western sanctions have little to no impact on the flow of weapons from Iran to Russia, making the alliance strategically valuable to both countries. But things are about to get even messier. A recent report by the Washington Post found that Iran will also begin selling their short-range ballistic missiles to Russia, which are deadlier than the Sahed drones. These developments pose a serious threat to Ukraine, which has also stepped up its calls for more Western support in the form of weapons and humanitarian aid. As the conflict becomes ever more international, there is a constant risk of escalation, especially as countries with previous rivalries like Iran and Israel get involved. Russia receiving a steady supply of these drones also means that nowhere in Ukraine is safe anymore. While ground fighting is still contained in the east of the country, Russia can use its new stockpile of Iranian weapons to attack cities and villages in the west of Ukraine. So even though the war has turned into an embarrassing failure, Russia may continue to rain death and destruction from above. There's no doubt that the use of the Sahed-136 drones marks a new and potentially terrifying phase of the war in Ukraine. Their precision targeting, unpredictability, long-range and cheap cost 
make them an ideal weapon for Russia's faltering military, not to mention that the growing alliance between Russia and Iran might also mark a new stage of the war, one where even more international forces are pulled into the fray. Now watch what if Russia launched a nuclear bomb minute by minute, or check out this is how you actually survive a nuclear attack.